Thank you, each and every one of you, for taking our invitation. Uh, this is only the first meeting, the first conference in a series of five that the Council of General of Romania uh, is organizing together with the uh, Romanian um, academic community uh, on the west coast of the United States, and of course, together with uh, uh, academic partners from the US and from Romania. So, thank you all for taking the invitation. The other four conferences that the Council of General of Romania intends to organize in the next uh, in the next immediate future, next two or three months, are going to tackle the medical sciences, IT business, military sciences, pedagogy. The series of five conferences, as a matter of fact, they are symposia because they are going to be interactive, are meant to celebrate the anniversary of 10th years from signing the joint declaration for the implementation of the part of, of strategic partnership between US and Romania that took place in September 2011. Romanians, Romanian American scientists are ready to participate in this effort to show the world that science is contributing globes of society and that science and technology give us a good solution for all the issues are, uh, that we are facing right now. I know that that has been interesting to participate in the conference, and we agree that we could not accommodate everybody, but let me inform you that uh, the Council of General Romania is going to record all these uh, symposia, all these conferences, and then they are going to be posted on the official YouTube channel of the Council of General and, of course, of all our partner institutions, all our partners. So we are very honored to have with us and to have the support of the government of Romania, of course, and of a lot of universities from US and Romania. And I thank to each and every one of you from the universities that are participating right now in the meeting. 
we know that we have guests and attendees from San Francisco and Los Angeles, but also we have attendees from University of, University of Bucharest, Yash, Rujnaboka, Timishwara. Uh, also, we uh, had the honor of having the support of two representatives, two members of the Romanian government, uh, the Minister of Foreign Affairs, uh, Honorable Ambassador Bogdan Aurescu, and the Minister of Research, Innovation, and Digitization, Mr. Ciprian Teleman. They couldn't be with us today as they are engaged in previous uh, official important international, uh, international meetings right now in Brussels and in Bucharest, but they, uh, they uh, sent us messages. Uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs, uh, Mr. Bogdan Aurescu, sent us a, me a written message that I'm going to, to read, to deliver to you right now. This thing is, yes, this is the message of the Minister of Foreign Affairs, Ambassador Bogdan Aurescu. It starts in Romanian, but soon it turns into English, the main language of, of the conference works. Stimate domnule doctor Marius, stimate domnule președinte Tito, distinguished participants, distinguished distinguished participants. Este o plăcere să transmit un mesaj la acest eveniment dedicat cooperării științifice, securitare și spațiale între România și SUA. Tema este inovatoare și extrem de interesantă pentru toți. Sunt convins că astfel de inițiative pe palierul cooperării științifice și academice au potențialul de a contribui la consolidarea în continuare a parteneriatului strategic dintre România și Statele Unite ale Americii. It is also my pleasure to highly welcome a series of conferences dedicated to the 10th anniversary of the joint declaration on strategic partnership for the 21st century between the United States of America and Romania, which I had honor to negotiate on behalf of Romania. This and solely strategic partnership provides us with an excellent opportunity to reaffirm the validity of the principles enshrined in the programmatic document and underline its contribution to strengthening our cooperation in all dimensions. As you know, strengthening and deepening the strategic partnership with the U.S. is one of the core pillars of Romania's foreign policy, alongside with the EU and the NATO membership. Romania and the United States of America have a history of close ties, and the scientific community brings a particular share to this relationship. We are very proud and grateful for your value contribution in this respect. This is the way in which Romania, together with the United States, demonstrate determination and willingness to respond to common challenges and threats, but also to promote new avenues of cooperation. Scientific exchanges, like those of today's conference, and consolidating of challenges. A sign of the vitality of our strategic partnership is the recent, recent expansion of its scope to address new areas of cooperation with a focus on strategic technologies such as civil nuclear energy, including small modular reactors, or the fourth generation reactors, or security of 5G networks, which are essential for our security and prosperity. Space has emerged during the past decade as a domain with increasing relevance and significance. In a Romanian expertise in the space domain, both in policy, including international space policy, in space research, and in practical application. Let me just list a few. This year, we celebrate the 14th anniversary since Mr. Dumitru Prunariu flew into space, May 14, 1981. He is the first Romanian to do so. We hope that Romanian participation in the European Space Agency will continue on this path. 
Romania has been a leader in the multilateral diplomacy as chair of the UN Committee on Peaceful Uses for Outer Space. We have also brought our expertise in various groups of governmental experts on space issues. Furthermore, Romania's diplomatic efforts, alongside those of the US and of the other countries, advanced the UN resolution for reducing space threats through norms, rules, and principles for responsible behavior when members. Last but not least, the human resource remained the most powerful driver of our cooperation as reflected in this discussion. I honor the efforts and achievements of leading researchers such as our speaker today. I look forward to see the new generation of researchers, entrepreneurs, and policy professionals brought together by the vision that space is not something of the future, but something of today. A successful conference. So, uh, Minister Aurescu is one of the main career diplomats that led Romania on this path of a consolidated, strong, powerful partnership with the United States. First, I'd like to congratulate of the 10th anniversary of the signing of the joint declaration on the implementation of the strategic partnership for the 21st century between Romania and the United States of America. I see it as a very good opportunity to enhance the cooperation between Romanian and American academic community, and it is my great pleasure to address to such a distinct Romania, as an European and also developing its own space program according to the national strategy and in concordance and complementarity with other international programs. Space research, technology, and development are recognizing strategic area, having a distinct role of driving force for other fields. This strategic commitment was proved by positive evolution of the national space program, but also by an important increase of the Romania committed significant participation in the European Space Agency for most, most of the actual and new exploration, applications and technology programs. Significant industrial contributions were undertaken by for launchers, for example, satellite communication and navigation. Applications were developed in the areas of smart agriculture, telemedicine, and disaster management. Space applications were also developed in the frame of the European Commission, where the Horizon 2020 program is supporting the development and launch of the very successful Copernicus. Also, the Galileo European GNSS, which became operational. Romania is a relevant participant in the space surveillance and tracking consortium of several EU member states. Space is considered in the EU and also in Romania a distinct field of activity, having a high degree of multidisciplinarity. Romanian space projects, SMEs, large industrial companies, associations, and clusters. More than 170 remaining distinct entities are registered in the ESA's list of contractors, powered by more than 1,200 1, FTE professionals. This sector is rapidly, rapidly increasing, and the support of the diaspora would be needed in providing This conference is offering an excellent occasion to continue the dialogue we 
within the framework of the academic dimension of the strategic partnership between the United States of America and Romania. I wish you a successful conference. Best success in all your projects and all your endeavors. So without no any other further ado, uh, I propose you to dive in directly in the main in the main course of our uh, symposia symposium right now, and uh, to listen to the presentation of uh, these six bright minds that uh, accepted our invitation to to give us their remarks and uh, part of their experience in in research and not only as we are going to see. And uh, let me start by introducing Mr. Dumitru Dorin Prunariu that has been already mentioned by the Minister Aurescu uh, in, uh, in his message as the first Romanian that flew into outer space. So, Dr. Dorin Dumitru Prunariu, a cosmonaut and, a Romanian, and working for the Romanian Association for Space Technology and Industry, Ram Space, a member of the board of the Romanian Space Agency. He also was an expert, and he earned a degree in, in aerospace engineering from the University Politecnica of Bucharest and a PhD in the field of space flight dynamics. Dr. Prunariu is also a graduate of the National in 1981. He accompanied today's space flight on the board of Soyuz 40 spacecraft, six space station, becoming the 103rd Romanian human in the outer space. I'm sorry, human. Prunariu is an Air Force retired Lieutenant General, a, honora a honorary member of the Romanian Academy, member of the board of the International Academy of Astronautics, expert for space activities within, and owns positions in many international space organizations as ESA, European Space Agency, UN. COP UOS, Association of Space Explorer, Moon Village Association, Asteroid Foundation, and so on. Since 2010, Amario served as a chairman of the United Nations Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space. Now he is a vice chair of the same committee in the Working Group of Space Agenda and working in the Working Group of, on Space Agenda 2030. In 2012, he was appointed as one of the 15 experts of the group of government experts on outer space transparency and confidence building measures established by the UN General Assembly resolutions number 64 or 68. In 2018, Dr. Prunariu was appointed as one of the 25 members of the group of the governmental experts on further practical measures for the prevention of the armed race in outer space established by the UN General Assembly. Dr. Prunariu was also a member of the task force elaborating a report on space security for Europe in the framework of the European Institute for Security Studies issued in 2016. Dr. Prunariu is an honorary citizen of several cities and Dr. Honoris Causa of several higher education institutions from Romania, Republic of Moldova and USA. As a, as a recognition of his achievements in 2017, an asteroid was named, with his name, the asteroid 10707 Trunari. Dr. Dumitru Dorin Prunari, thank you for accepting our invitation to come in our conference and Congratulations again for your numerous achievements. Dr. Funari is going to have a presentation about the 40th anniversary 
of the first space flight of a Romanian citizen in the outer space, and an analysis of the human condition into the outer space. Dr. Prunario, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, let me first uh, greet all the guests and all the participants to this uh, very interesting and important uh, workshop conference. And uh, I want to start uh, before starting my presentation. I want to point out the one fact because I will speak uh, first about the history because uh, we have to know the history to build the present and the future. I want to point out that Romania during the Cold War was the only Eastern European country that uh, broadcast the moon landing live. I know I was a teenager and I follow in the morning, four and a half in the morning, uh, the moon landing. And I was very impressed by all these things. At the same time, Romania was the only uh, Eastern European country at that time during the Cold War using, by an agreement with the United States, landscape images uh, for the national interest of Romania. And also we had the opportunity at that time to train some specialists in Western countries, by instance, for remote sensing in France. So we had uh, quite uh, separate and uh, most favorably um, approach to, to the cooperation with Western countries at that time. But uh, in the same time, to cooperate at the multilateral level um, on space activities, we're obliged to, just one minute, uh, we're obliged to do it in the framework of uh, uh, the Warsaw Treaty uh, with, uh, just one minute, <coughs> one minute, so. Do you see my screen? Because I have, okay, okay, now we start. So, well, uh, I will talk first about uh, what was before. See, uh, we had the opportunity to take part in multi-national, uh, international uh, activity uh, regarding space activities in the framework of the Intercosmos program. The Intercosmos program started in 1967 and comprised the countries of the Eastern Bloc, along with other states like Afghanistan, Cuba, Mongolia, and Vietnam. In addition, some non-aligned nations such as India and Syria participated, and even France and Austria. Uh, the program started with development of many scientific satellites. The launch and operation of Intercosmos satellites was a success uh, with scientific benefits. Uh, okay. Each country paid for its own contribution, just taking into account that the rockets uh, were uh, uh, supplied by Russians for free at that time. In July uh, 76, uh, was signed an agreement, intergovernmental agreement for cooperation in the peaceful exploration of space, which authorized the participation of member countries in Soviet men and space flight, each country having the possibility to send one of these nationals free of charge on a Soyuz vessel. So the joint manned space flight enabled 14 non-Soviet cosmonauts to participate in space flights between 1978 and 1988. Uh, you see the first uh, team of intercosmos uh, cosmonauts flown into space. I want just to mark Vladimir Remek, who flew in uh, 1978, was the first non-American, non-Soviet, non-Russian uh, astronaut of the world. And uh, with the entry of the Czech Republic and Slovakia into the European Union, Vladimir Remek is considered to be the first person from Eastern, from European Union flown into space. Uh, well, uh, we uh, had me as the first Romanian cosmonaut. I flew in space between uh, May 14 and 22. And now, in May 14, I will have the 40th anniversary of my space flight. You see the logo of my space flight and me during the space uh, flight. How it uh, all started? We were 
invited uh, to volunteer for the selection for astronauts, cosmonauts in uh, 1977. And you see here in Baku, in a military unit where we were trained in the first, in the very beginning, the team of the Romanian candidates at that time. Mm -hmm. uh, the second from uh, left, it's Dumitru Dediu, who was my backup, and me. And the third one was the second uh, down from the right, the Christian Guran, who was an active participant at the aviation programs connected with the outer space and became also uh, an officer in the Air Force, like uh, I did. A few images from the selection, my selection uh, in 77, medical testing in the uh, Center for um, Airspace uh, and uh, Aeronautical uh, Medical uh, Testing Facilities in Bucharest. You see here the second intercosmos group. I was part together with Dumitru Dediu of that group. Uh, and you see a picture from Star City uh, right in the beginning of our uh, training uh, in Star City. It, the picture was taken in March 78. And the logo of our space flight. I'll pass uh, a little bit quick for this because I have the second part of the presentation which I think it's also very interesting. You see a few images for our training, uh, scientific training on the left upper corner, me and Popov learning how to use a device for scientific research. Uh, you see the centrifuge on the right side, we were training at 8G in the centrifuge. You see me down in an airplane in weightlessness floating in the airplane for about uh, 25, 27 seconds, and some uh, medical uh, uh, training together with Dediu. Also, at the end of the three years training, uh, the final exams of Soyuz 40 space crew formed by me and Leonid Popov from Russia. You see the image. Uh, in the image, it's seen also the well-known hero of the space, uh, uh, Mr. Leonov, Alexei Leonov, who was a legend and who was uh, a very good friend of Tom Stafford, a four-star general uh, from the US. They flew together in 75 in the Soyuz Apollo program, the first international cooperation between the Soviet Union and the United States of America. On the right side, it's a family a picture uh, in Star City, me, my family, my sons, and Popo and his wife. So the main crew was formed by me and Popov. The backup crew decided later, just before the space flight, formed by uh, Dumitru Dediu and Yuri Romanenko, and an image from the Star City. Uh, before the launch uh, on May 14, in the evening of May 14, uh, one image is giving a report to a governmental commission that we are ready to accomplish the space flight in good conditions. You see the rocket uh, who is uh, taken to the launch pad and the rocket starting to the outer space at 8 p.m. Uh, and uh, 17 minutes, uh, the Bucharest time. Some images from the board of uh, the space station, uh, we had uh, some medical experiments and I will speak later about medical experiments only. Uh, every day I had a lot of sensors of me and I uh, we translated to a special device who sent to the earth, to the medical staff, all my medical parameters. Uh, I published a lot of scientific experiments, uh, astrophysical experiments, technological experiments, and you see me on board Salyut 6 space station uh, doing different types of activities. This is the Salyut 6 space station with uh, Soyuz T4 spacecraft docked. With Soyuz T4 came the main crew on board Salyut 6 when we flew into the outer space. The picture was taken by myself after undocking on May 22, 
uh, I had a mission to take pictures from around the space station to see the level of degradation after many years. On May 22, I landed. Uh, my records were 7 days, 20 hours, 42 minutes in outer space. I accomplished 22 scientific experiments in fields such as astrophysics, cosmic radiation, cosmic technologies, biology, cosmic medicine, psychology also. I did uh, 5,226,000 kilometers around the globe at a maximum altitude of 384 kilometers. You see the landing place, the parachute, uh, which took me to the land. And uh, now I just want to stress one type of experiments. We did studies on the medical problems that astronauts uh, face in uh, space flight. Biomedical experiments accomplished uh, by Soyuz 40 space crew, me and Popov on board Salyut 6 space station, have contributed to the completion of both existing knowledge on the behavior of the human body in conditions specific to space flight and to the progress of basic research in aeronautical medicine and biology. <clears throat> so I connected with the actual studies on the medical problems that astronauts face into the outer space and I show you a few <coughs> reports into the outer space, just one minute. Uh, the longest period space in, spent in space belongs to Gennady Padalka, the Russian Gennady Padalka, who spends 879 days in five space flights. Christina Koch from the United States just established a new record for a woman into the outer space. She spent 328 days in space on board the International Space Station in 2020. The longest un the uninterrupted space flight belongs to Valery Polyakov. It's 438 days continuously on board Mir space station between January 94 and March 95. The oldest man into the outer space, it's uh, the first American astronaut, John Glenn, who accomplished his second flight when he was 77 years old in October 98. And also an out outstanding flight belongs to the NASA astronaut Scott Kelly and the Russian cosmonaut Mikhail Kornienko. They spent 340 days in space between March 2015 and March 2016. Actually, they studied uh, the modification in the human body, preparing uh, a long flight to other uh, planets. I mean, Moon and Mars in the future. All these studies are very important to know how people behave into the outer space in the completely different conditions than on Earth. Some risks related to the stress placed on the space travelers. Uh, the risk belongs to gravity fields, isolation, confinement, hostile, close environments, space radiation, and distance from Earth. Taking one by one, I can say that gravity field uh, uh, between uh, taking into account the transition from one gravity field to another affects special orientation, head eye and head uh, hand eye coordination, balance, locomotion, astronauts experience uh, motion sickness. I mean here when you fly to the moon and to other planets in the far future to Mars. But without any gravity, as you spend time on board the space station, you face uh, loss of minerals from bounds and loss of calcium, a greater risk of osteoporosis related fractures later in life, loss muscle strength, endurance, and experience cardiovascular deconditioning. Fluids in body shifts upward to the head pressure on eyes causing vision problems, and you also develop kidney stones due to de dehydration and increased excretion of calcium from bones. This is caused by the gravity field. Isolation confinement. It causes a decline in mood, cognition, moral, interpersonal uh, interactions. Sleep disorder because of circ circadian, circadian rhythm. 
noisy environment, prolonged isolation and confinement, depression, fatigue. Also, it leads to the misunderstandings and impaired communications, impact performance and mission success. Psychological and cognitive decrease. Third quarter effect, morale and motivation decline three quarters of the way into a mission. May develop behavioral uh, or cognitive conditions and psychiatric disorders. Look what leads to, to the cosmonauts when you fly long time into the outer space. So the outer space is a hostile, a close environment. From the point of view of ecosystem, Ecosystem has a big role in everyday astronaut life. It is change into the outer space. Microbes change characteristics into the outer space. It could affect the astronauts and cosmonauts. Microorganisms transferred more easily from person to person. This is the problem when you fly into the outer space, you are checked and you are isolated a period of time to not take with you microorganisms and to affect the main crews on board the space stations. Stress hormone levels, it's elevated into the outer space. Immune system, it's altered. Increased susceptibility to allergies and other illnesses and diseases. From the point of view of space radiation, this is one of the most dangerous aspects of traveling to Mars. Seven months in the interplanetary space uh, where the level of radiation is pretty high. On the space station, over 10 times the radiation than on Earth exists. And uh, the radiation level is not so elevated as, as during uh, an interplanetary flight, flight because part of the radiation is captured by the uh, radiation belts uh, of, the, of the Earth, by the electromagnetic field. Earth magnetic field and atmosphere offer a protection against cosmic radiation. Increased cancer risk because of the space radiation on astronauts damage central nervous systems with consequences of cognitive functions, motor function, and behavioral changes. Also, you may face radiation sickness, nausea, vomiting, anorexia, and fatigue. Also, degenerative tissue diseases such as cataracts, cardiac and cardio uh, circulatory diseases, and any protection is not perfect against the radiation. Uh, regarding the cataract, I may tell you that about 20-30% uh, of the astronauts, several years after the space flight, they have problems with the eyes and they make cataract and they face a surgery. I did it a few years ago. Uh, distance from Earth. Distance from Earth uh, also caused some problems for the astronauts. Uh, the problems to face uh, this uh, distance, uh, high distance from Earth, its planning and sufficiency are the key. Distance to Mars, it's about 225 million kilometers, million kilometers on average. Communications delay up to 20 minutes one way while on Mars. You send a message from Earth, it takes about 10 minutes. You send the message back and you receive on the Earth after 20 minutes the, the message you send from, from the Earth to Mars and back. Possibility of equipment failure on uh, flying on other planets. You have to be able to complete the mission on your own sometimes. Type of food and medicine to take on a three years trip. There is a problem you have to face and to preview all uh, problems that uh, could uh, face uh, during a very long space flight. So one of the problems, we want to colonize other planets, Mars by instance. Can a baby be born in space? Humans may encounter reproductive challenges in gravity environments different than Earth's. Gravitational forces may disrupt mammalian life cycle processes and actively hereditary shape genomes. Permanent surface settlements may be infeasible if partial gravity reproduction challenges are too great to overcome. There are studies, they will be studies, and uh, there is a real problem to be studied by the science medicine. In medical science, 
Is medical science prepared to make humans compatible with migration to other planets? Are reasons for migration from Earth, global natural hazards from outer space or man-made hazards could be a cause for deciding to migrate from Earth. What some scientists said about migration from Earth. Former NASA administrator Michael Griffin identified in 2005 space colonization as the ultimate goal of current spaceflight program saying, the goal isn't just scientific exploration. It's also about extending the range of human, human habitat out from Earth into the solar system as we go forward in time. In the long run, a single planet species will not survive. If we humans want to survive for hundreds of thousands of millions of years, we must ultimately populate other planets. I know that humans will colonize the solar system and one day go beyond. What said in 2006 uh, Stephen Hawking, he stated that humanity faces two options. Either we colonize space within the next 200 years and build residential units on other planets, or we'll face the prospect of long-term extinction. So now let's come to Elon Musk, a well-known private uh, entrepreneur in the space field. In January 2020, Musk said he plans to send 1 million people to Mars by 2050. This involves building 1,000 Starship rockets over 10 years. That's 100 starship every year and launching an average of three starship per day. There will be a lot of jobs on Mars, he added. In December 2020, Musk said that he remains highly confident that SpaceX will land humans on Mars by 2026, adding that it's an achievable goal about six years from now. The important thing is that we establish Mars at a self-sustaining civilization. And some final considerations. Technologies for, humans, for human exploration of interplanetary space are advanced. Permanent habitats outside the Earth, they are critical issues related to human conditions. The irreversible transformations of the human body ultimately related to the perpetuation and survival of the human species. Establish permanently outside the Earth, new generations of people will develop another consciousness, create other cultures, rules, develop other beliefs, will discover new elements related to the origin of life in universe. Terra will remain a historical landmark in the evolution of humankind. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Prunario. Absolutely impressive. Absolutely impressive. Thank you very much. It's uh, it's a privilege to have you uh, with us here and uh, having you sharing with us uh, your personal experience uh, from outer space. Uh, you took us from your personal contact with the outer space, your personal uh, risks that you that you faced, and uh, the risk that uh, human kind of faces. When, when traveling uh, in the outer space. And uh, then you passed to uh, some economic effects and consequences for uh, the, the mankind after developing enough technology for visiting the outer space, traveling and making colonies there. And I think that's a very challenging uh, topic for our discussions uh, after uh, the, uh, the presentations of our colleagues here and uh, I'm launching that challenge to you, to all the six of you, to develop your opinions about the economic, social, and of course, uh, life consequences uh, for, for mankind, for humans, after uh, establishing colonies on the Moon and on Mars. And now, uh, I would like to, to turn the page and to pass to uh, one of our you know, speakers from here, from Los Angeles, Dr. Adrian Stoika.
Thank you, Dr. Stoika, for accepting uh, our invitation and uh, for uh, agreeing to, to sharing with us some of your uh, extraordinary experience as a specialist working a lifetime here for, for uh, NASA. So allow me to uh, introduce Dr. Stoika to you, dear guests. Dr. Adrian Stoika was born and educated in Yash, Romania. He received his uh, uh, Graduate Diploma in Electrical Engineering in 1986 from the Technical University of Yash. He worked in the industry and as an assistant professor at the same university. In 1992, he moved to Melbourne, Australia, and did a PhD in Robotics at the Victoria University. His PhD thesis, completed in 1995, introduced robot motion learning by imitation. In early 1996, after winning the so-called Green Car Lottery, he joined NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory, JPL, here in California Institute of Technology in Pasadena, and he is still there 25 years later. For 12 years, he led many advanced technology projects funded by NASA, DARPA, and other organizations. He contributed several new concepts and performed several world first technology demonstrations. In 2008, he became senior research scientist, the highest JPL denomination equivalent to full professor at Caltech. And he took over as supervisor of the robotic systems estimation decision and control group. Since 2018, he manages the JPL Blue Sky Studies program and the JPL Innovation to Flight program. He also supports the JPL Office of Strategic Planning. He's to stay actively involved in the Romanian cultural and social events in the Los Angeles area. As someone with all his blood relatives in Romania, except for his son, newly born, he keeps close contact with his country of birth and was several times involved in organizing various events in Yash. For everything you watch, as a scientist and as a member, of the Romanian American academic community here of the United States. Dr. Adrian Stoica uh, is going to present us some remarks, some thoughts about the words of solar power infrastructure at the moon's South Pole. So, a step ahead from the presentation of Dr. Prunario. Dr. Stoica, the screen is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much for the introduction. Um, hello, everyone. I'm trying to see if I can share this and you can see it. So uh, I'm very honored to, uh, to present after a symbolic figure of Romania, uh, great admired and respected by Romanians from everywhere. Um, my, my presentation takes us uh, uh, on the way to Mars, but it's stopping on the moon. Uh, and it uh, shows certain aspects that could help in uh, um, colonizing perhaps uh, uh, the, the moon. Um, there's a, a famous uh, Kraft Ehrike who said, uh, if uh, um, God wanted uh, uh, men to become a spacefaring species, it would have given a moon, it would have given him a moon. So we are very fortunate in this respect uh, for, for having the moon. Um, the first part of uh, my presentation is a preamble to the more technical part. Uh, and the thoughts are mine, do not represent NASA's view. Uh, the second part is a more recent presentation that uh, um, 
uh, it's part of a NASA advanced concept study, uh, which I led in, in the past uh, few years. Um, so the, the, my presentation is again uh, showing the moon as a preferred destination for now uh, for, for many um, national space programs. And again, with a view towards Mars, um, but for the moon, um, the first step, of course, is getting there at an affordable cost. And I think that is coming soon uh, through efforts, uh, both from the space agencies and we've seen from the private industry, from uh, companies like SpaceX, uh, Blue Origin, uh, and so on. Um, then becomes the second challenge, which is basically surviving on the moon. And uh, radiation was mentioned. And uh, the other aspect that is uh, uh, going to be a problem is the the the, the low temperatures, the, especially when obviously when you don't have uh, the sunlight, the temperatures go uh, very low. Uh, we're talking about uh, uh, minus 238 degrees in the in the uh, bottom of the craters. That's minus 396 Fahrenheit. Uh, so uh, surviving this uh, cold um, requires um, you know sources of energy. And the, the focus of this uh, talk is to uh, present a, a solar power infrastructure, which uh, could provide the power and warm up robotics uh, equipment and, and, and human, and would uh, basically provide the, uh, the, the power uh, for operations. So um, <clears throat> I, I'd like to, to, to show one slide about uh, uh, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Um, the, the uh, it's sorry for the crowded slide. Uh, uh, all, all is important to know in here. We are um, the lead uh, NASA center for robotic space exploration. Uh, it's about six thousand people, two point seven billion dollar budget, and it's a federally funded lab uh, managed by Caltech for NASA. Um, and among the the things that uh, you know are. Um, most known about us, we built the first uh, US satellite, Explorer 1, in 58. Um, we operated the first landers on the moon. Uh, our spacecraft visits all planets. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, the Voyager spacecraft uh, is now in the interstellar space after 44 years of operation. Uh, but most we are probably known for the, the Mars rovers. And uh, soon, hopefully, we, for the Mars helicopter, which uh, uh, is uh, due to, for a first uh, uh, powered flight on an atmosphere of another planet, that is um, uh, in uh, in a few days uh, uh, from, from from now. So, uh, um, in this talk, however, I will uh, focus on, on on the Moon, and uh, the current program from NASA for uh, lunar exploration is uh, called Artemis program. Uh, and uh, uh, the, the main element of Artemis, uh, again, as the stepping stone for going to Mars, is uh, um, establishing uh, a, a long-term uh, presence uh, on the surface of the Moon, uh, also in, uh, establishing a, a lunar orbiting station, so the so-called gateway, which also would be, again, uh, uh, a mechanism to test also for, for uh, going further to, to, to Mars. Uh, and also uh, an aspect is this time NASA is not planning to go alone, uh, but also to involve uh, heavily the industry and, and uh, uh, a variety of partners from both from industry and, and from uh, in the international uh, arena. Um, so Artemis, as I mentioned, it's, it's a preparation for going to Mars and uh, uh, a couple of uh, uh, things again emphasized in here is uh, are the artemis base camp which is, is going to be um, at the south pole of the moon uh, and, and the gateway is, is uh, important uh, uh, elements um, the um, not only the government uh, money as i mentioned but also private investors uh, would uh, uh, be participating into this effort, and uh, if, if we look at the the planned uh, missions for 2021, uh, uh, actually this is a, a table for for a longer period, but we would have uh, by the end of 2021 uh, nine countries expected to have landers and rovers on the lunar surface, 
Uh, those are basically carried by two U.S. lenders, the Peregrine from Astrobotics and uh, Novasi from Intuitive Machines. Um, but uh, uh, as you see, uh, many countries are uh, planning to uh, place rovers and, and, uh, and landers on, on, on the surface of the moon. And in particular, the, the South Pole is of great interest, and I'm going to get back to this aspect. Uh, I was looking for a slide to show the Chinese uh, presence uh, being the most active uh, uh, country on the moon in the recent years. Uh, and I found this one, which is emphasizing the flags on the moon, uh, which is a bit uh, interesting from the point of view that obviously most flags right now seem to be placed by the Chinese. Uh, but uh, uh, I want to emphasize the, the um, landing on the far side of the moon. Uh, which is an interesting uh, uh, first, um, and uh, the fact that on the uh, Chang uh, Five, uh, basically a sample return uh, uh, from the moon. Now, uh, the things that are perhaps not uh, well, they are not shown in here, and maybe create a perception. And I added them as points in here. Uh, the so first soft landing actually were in 1966, first by Luna 9 and the Surveyor 1. I mentioned the JPL operated mission. And of course, the first sample return uh, was, uh, uh, you know, 50 years before the Chinese one by Luna 16. But uh, still, uh, clearly at this moment, uh, the, the Chinese have the, the, the most uh, sustained program uh, for, for, for the moon. So uh, I mentioned a couple of uh, um, uh, locations that, uh, that or a couple of uh, plans for for stations. So Artemis Base Camp again at the South Pole. Uh, China uh, um, also intends to build a, a moon base in the next ten years, and recently has signed an agreement, a memorandum of understanding with uh, uh, Russia for cooperation in the construction of the International Lunar Research Station. And I think that could be partly in orbit and part on the on the moon base on the ground. Uh, and uh, a, a very interesting uh, concept uh, um, proposed initially by the, the Europeans and uh, uh, which was uh, adopted in, by um, uh, many other uh, countries uh, is the concept of the moon village, which is uh, a, a true international collaboration, uh, cooperation on, on, on the surface of the moon, which could be an interesting example of how we could uh, uh, partner in space and, and perhaps further on, uh, on, on Mars. Why is the moon is, is the uh, logical next step for, for a sustained mission? Well, uh, it, it's, it's much closer. So we are talking about uh, two and a half, three days uh, for traveling there, uh, as opposed to six months going to Mars. Uh, the issues for Mars are, again, radiation is very important and we don't quite have good solutions for that. It requires, uh, well, it would require a very good shielding, perhaps with water tanks and so on, but that adds to the, to the uh, you know, what the rockets need, need to, to uh, trans to boost, to, to carry. So uh, it's still a complicated problem, but moon is closer. We could uh, um, do um, uh, um, a variety of experiments in, in there and uh, um, uh, it can um, uh, be a good test ground uh, for, for, for the future trips to, to, to Mars. So, uh, um, there is a value uh, in, in many respects to, to the moon itself, other than a stepping stone. Uh, there are a variety of resources there on the moon. And interesting enough, water is one of the most important resources on the moon. Um, there, there are uh, plans for having uh, tourism, and, and I'm trying to move towards uh, showing certain aspects related to an economy. How, how can various companies perhaps uh, uh, make their profits on the moon. And uh, Elon Musk actually, I think uh, he already sold at least for an orbital flight around the moon, the, at least a ticket to a, a, a Japanese uh, uh, billionaire. And uh, um, uh, it's important to use as a test bed for, for again, for te testing technologies, doing science and so on. Uh, but it's also interesting as a spaceport with its own production of propellant. So I mentioned the water from water would obtain liquid hydrogen and oxygen, which is basically the, the, the propellant for rockets. And, and uh, certain companies, for example, uh, or entities, for example, the United Launch Alliance already established price for 
uh, how much would they would pay for uh, water, for example, on the surface of moon. I think it was like $600 per liter for, for uh, that. So, um, and of course, it is interesting because the, the gravitational, uh, 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 the, the gravity well is, is, is much smaller on the moon. So, um, you know, it's easier, let's say, to, uh, and to be cheaper to transport uh, into space uh, water and propellant from the moon than from, from Earth. And um, now I'm transitioning to, to this presentation, which was uh, given a few days ago uh, at the IEEE Aerospace Conference, and it's focusing on building a solar power um, uh, infrastructure. It's, it's a, actually utilities and data infrastructure. I'm not going to emphasize the data, but because all this infrastructure is line of sight to each other, it also uh, allows for the uh, uh, communication and data transmission. So. Um, why the South Pole? Uh, I think that there is a very interesting resources in, in that area, and I'm showing here the treasure maps for the, for the lunar South Pole. Uh, in particular, there is a, a sunlight, uh, lots of sunlight that's in that region in, in the higher uh, points about the ground. Uh, so in, in some regions, uh, over 80% of the time uh, illumination, the, the sun is always at the horizon, rotating very low at the horizon, but uh, uh, you could see almost permanently the sun over there. On the other hand, in the um, craters on, on the moon, uh, the sun rays never get, and that is the, the freezing cold uh, temperature where actually uh, there is uh, water uh, ice and uh, billions of years of uh, uh, water ice accumulated. And, and basically these regions are close to each other. So you have the on the rim of the crater, for example, we have almost permanent sun. In the depth of the crater, uh, you have um, freezing cold and water. Uh, by the way, the, the South Pole is on the rim of uh, a Shackleton crater, uh, which is a 20 kilometers uh, diameter uh, crater, uh, four kilometers uh, deep. Um, so uh, assuming that we are extracting water from there, um, for the, the, the main uh, um, uh, reason for, for the larger amounts of water would be not for, for the human, um, but basically for propellant. The, the initial population is, is uh, assumed to be small in the beginning compared to how much water would be needed for a propellant. Um, and there is a variety of studies, but uh, the most uh, ambitious, or I should say the one with, which gives the largest amount of quantity of water that, that could be extracted is, is uh, from a colleague of mine, uh, Brian Willock, Wilcox. Uh, which uh, proposed uh, um, an architecture for uh, uh, human exploration of Mars enabled uh, solely by propellant uh, from the water from the lunar poles. Uh, and uh, I'm not going to go through the details of it, but uh, basically, um, and I'm not sure the screen is showing uh, very clearly at the very bottom here, but we are talking about uh, uh, 7.5 tons of liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen per day uh, which is basically 10 tons of water extraction per day uh, if we want to sustain this scenario. Now, how do we get this water? Um, well, we need power in order to, 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 to you know, to, to power the, the equipment that would do the in-situ resource utilization, ISRU. And uh, one idea to get the power at this moment, uh, the, the only idea for the near term for getting large amounts of power is actually using the solar energy, which I mentioned that's available uh, plenty in, in that area. The first uh, time that the idea was to use uh, basically a reflector uh, or a mirror um, uh, to in space to um, redirect it uh, as a power source belongs to uh, Hermann Oberth. Um, and uh, these are some drawings from 1920s um, of the, uh, a, a mirror in, in space that would redirect uh, to Earth. If, if that was the, the intent uh, to, to the poles uh, to warm the Earth polar regions. Um, uh, in fact, actually, the, the Russians uh, did an experiment with uh, such a mirror uh, in uh, in 93. Uh, Znamia 2 was a 20 meter diameter successful experiment um, that they did. And in fact, these mirrors actually um, exist on Earth. There are two locations that I'm aware of, one in uh, uh, Ryukan in Norway and one in Viganella in Italy. Uh, I visited the one in, in uh, Norway. Uh, the panels are small, so in the, the this village that is between the mountains doesn't see the sun for many months uh, uh, during the year, they place the mirror 
uh, on the top of the mountain uh, in the view of the sun, and that one reflects down into the into the town, uh, you know, center. And even though it's not, uh, the mirrors are not large enough to produce uh, sufficient uh, heat. Uh, it actually does improve the mood of the locals and and attracts also some some tourists to that. So the same idea is basically for the moon, uh, basically getting some solar towers with uh, reflectors, mirrors, if you want to call them. Uh, and the, the specific study in here focused on the Shackleton crater to see if we can power a rover mission um, uh, that would go deep into Shackleton. Uh, as I mentioned, the center is 10 kilometers away from the rim. Uh, and there are uh, basically different uh, curves that will tell you how, uh, depending on how much power would you like to have, uh, at what distance, how large would the, the reflector need to be. Um, the, the, the most important number in here to know is that a 40 meter diameter, which is about 1000 square meters, uh, is needed to reflect uh, a 300 watt uh, uh, per square meter at 10 kilometers. So that's about the same that we power the, the Mars rover. That's the same intensity that you, the solar that you get on, on, on Mars, uh, sufficient for powering uh, robotic equipment. Uh, if you want to extract the, the water, and there is a variety of concepts, I won't go over them, but I wanted to point maybe to the one on the right, which is basically a concept which does use exactly this reflected sunlight from, from the crater rim. And it has like a tent under which basically um, there is a sublimation of the water from the from the ground. So it doesn't need excavation per se. Other concepts are more focused on excavating the regolith and then extracting. By the way, the the amount of water is uh, uh, depending on the measurement. We still need to go there directly to 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 see in different locations. But it's somewhere between one percent to ten percent of water in the regolith. It's almost like extracting water from concrete here on Earth. So it's not necessarily an immediate or easy thing, and it requires certain power. But we are talking about a couple of megawatts uh, for uh, obtaining the 10 tons of uh, uh, water per day. Um, and um, uh, basically, the, one reflector of 40 meter diameter would provide this megawatt level at 10 kilometers. And, and um, you know, a larger one with uh, uh, 100 meters would provide uh, like 8 megawatts and, and, and so on. And it will give the full uh, 1.3 kilowatts per square meter uh, that uh, we have at one AU. So basically, uh, on, on the surface of the moon, actually, you get more sunlight, so to speak, than than on on Earth because uh, on Earth you have the atmosphere that reduces um, uh, the intensity. So we did a variety of experiments, both with uh, uh, how to to pack very compactly these reflectors and the towers. Uh, so, um, uh, we, the, the tower here is about 10 meter inflatable um, and uh, um, the, the calculations for a 100 meter tower uh, would be basically about 900 kilograms and about 8 cubic meters and the 1000 meter square reflector um, uh, would basically uh, fit into about 1 cubic meter and have about 230 uh, uh, kilograms. Um, I'm not sure you're seeing the bottom of the screen, which for me it's blocked in here, but basically the conclusion in here is that the total amount is uh, about a, a thousand uh, or so kilograms and less than 10 cubic meters, which is uh, about the, the, the size of uh, um, one of the, the recent Mars rovers. So it's not very much from the point of view of the, um, you know, uh, a space um, uh, thing that will replace on the moon. Now there is a different aspect that is interesting. With one, there is no single tower that you can see unless the tower is very tall, like uh, eight kilometers or so, uh, to have the full uh, continuous permanent view of the sun. Uh, there is no single tower that sees it. At some point, it's obstructed by some mountains in the, the area. But there is a, a but at another tower at a different location uh, could actually see it at a different moment. So when one goes in the dark, another one could could see it. So by placing a, a several towers, uh, in principle, um, and maybe focusing um, to the same region, which I call like an oasis of energy, you could ensure um, um, basically quasi permanent illumination into certain areas. Uh, and again, there are calculations depending on uh, how tall the towers are and where you place them, but you could achieve basically um, 
uninterrupted uh, uh, illumination, which uh, which has a couple of interesting consequences. By the way, I'm, the focus on this one has fo was mostly on reflecting the sunlight. Once you actually capture the sunlight, and if you want to convert it, you could beam it uh, either through laser or microwave. But there is certain advantages of reflecting the entire, um, let's say, um, sun view. Uh, so the, the concept is, is to extend from one tower to multiple towers and to build basically um, um, a power infrastructure or uh, soft, the, the, the reason for the acronym soft polyethylene data infrastructure is because it gets to SPUDIS, which is the name of a, a famous um, uh, lunar scientist who unfortunately passed away, but he was very um, um, active in promoting the value of the moon. Uh, on the lower left, I'm showing a couple of uh, uh, preferred locations at the South Pole for, for landing and for, for bases. Uh, the Shackleton Crater, again, is in the center of this lower square in here. Uh, and uh, the, the idea is to extend from the Shackleton Crater rim um, with a number of towers that would provide um, power uh, to assets operating um, to, to equipment, to robotic equipment, and also actually to, to human uh, uh, emissions. So uh, this is the last slide, and I just wanted to, to say a couple of things about the benefits of such a, a power infrastructure. And again, I'm focusing here on, on the, the power only, but uh, it is also a communication infrastructure as well. Um, so uh, as opposed to having laser beams or uh, either way directly, uh, when you illuminate an entire area, um, you could add many robots and many of them can operate in the same illuminated region without actually having to take care of each of them. Uh, it's obviously for successive robotic missions, everybody coming in there receives the same um, illumination and, and, and uh, energy. Uh, there is no need for interrupts. Right now, uh, in order to survive the lunar night, for example, uh, systems go in hibernation unless, unless they have a nuclear uh, source. Um, so uh, basically, uh, you could operate permanently. And the most important ones, it lowers the barriers to entry uh, for, for many players because they don't need to uh, have the extreme environment temperatures, but they can actually prepare equipment almost like for the earth temperatures, which will be ensured into these areas. And obviously there is a, a, a less technology needed and there is a much lower cost. It also the cost for ensuring this thermal management is um, postponed until you confirm the landing. So you don't invest into something and only to see that you've crash landed, uh, but you could pay also, and that's the interesting part of the new business model, with the smaller payments incrementally as you go, basically buying power from the infrastructure, uh, as opposed to carrying your own nuclear device for, for uh, powering. So it reduces the risk and so on. So overall, it reduces the cost of surface operations and could help uh, the start of a lunar economy. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Stoika. Um, I must say that in a very small, small amount of time, you succeeded in passing a lot of information uh, covering a lot of very interesting aspects uh, about uh, about the moon exploration and the travel into space. Uh, Departing from from the economic from the economic conditions and uh, interest for profit that exist everywhere. And from race from uh, for for uh, resources, and uh, of course for developing uh, new routes for the money, for the resource, and for tourism, and then passing to uh, some of the essentials that we have to keep in mind in order to develop a colony uh, on the moon: uh, the energy needed, the water needed. And what it comes into my mind right now is that until we will make some money on the moon, we will have to spend a lot of money from the Earth. And that we should uh, keep in mind that Earth still is the home of mankind and we should preserve it better. Uh, thank you again, and I wish you the best uh, success in everything you're doing at NASA. I must say that I'm very proud to see that Romanian American scientists are well and successfully involved in 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 a, in a top research for for space conquest now allow me to uh, to pass to the to the next uh, to the next uh, um, 
guest with a nice speaker that uh, made us the honor to, to, to participate in, in, in the symposium, Dr. Ioana Kosmuta. Uh, I can see I can see her online and uh, allow me to, to tell you some some uh, facts about Dr. Kosmuta. Trying to okay. Dr. Kosmuta is the founder and CEO of G Space Incorporated. Originally from Bayamare in Romania, Dr. Ioana Kosmuta graduated with a BSc in physics from the University of Babes Boyoi in Cluj Napoca. She holds a PhD in applied physics from the University of Groningen in Netherlands, a postdoctoral title in materials and computational chemistry at Caltech and a postdoctoral degree in the Genome Technology Center at Stanford University. She is the founder and the CEO of the G-Space Incorporated, a company set to discover new materials by liberating the potential design space from the limiting eff effects of the gravitational force. Dr. Kosmutsa's work at the confluence of, uh, is found at the confluence of space and earth is based on a on twenty year on a twenty year career in academia at NASA and in the startup world. From her nanotechnology research to engineering projects for missions such as hypersonics, Stardust, Mars Science Laboratory, Orion, and the International Space Station commercialization, Dr. Kosmutsa has built a legacy for in, on transforming the status quo, opening new look beyond the world of origin to understand our future. She was the first to talk in the New Space Journal in 2017 about the commercial potential for SB land optical fiber space manufacturing, several government entities and startup incentivizing investments in this area today. This is one of the many impactful outcomes of her work in the Emerging Space Office commissioned by NASA to build defensible business cases for ISS and LEO commercialization. She is also the co-founder of the Nexus Out Space for All Brain Trust with a mission to collaborate with UNOOCA to support the, the next generation of space pioneer and to educate and to create opportunities for civil society and the present the transfer and social application of science in a day-to-day -day life. Dr. Kosmutsa, the screen is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, thank you, everybody, for taking the time to be here today and uh, to join us. It is my honor and pleasure to be here. Um, thank you, uh, Mr. Uh, Dumitrescu, for, for your very kind invitation and for all the efforts in organizing this series. Uh, very much appreciated. Um, thank you to uh, Dumitru Prunaru and... Uh, um, Marius Pisa for uh, for their presence from Romania. It is always uh, a, a great pleasure to to be with you on the same uh, uh, on the same events, and as well to my fellow colleagues from uh, for, former colleagues from NASA. Um, uh, so I hope I can uh, take you a little bit uh, in between these worlds and. Um, while I won't make it a personal journey, um, I hope that the story. Uh, will connect with you uh, across science, technology, and and uh, commercialization. Um, so I'm going to take a minute here to um, share my screen. Okay. Are you seeing my screen? Yeah. Can Can you also hear me? Yes, we can hear you, and we can see your screen. Thank you, Dr. Kosmota. Sure. Thank you. Okay, so I entitled my presentation, um, The Lens of Space, uh, because I discovered myself um, after being at NASA that, um, um, and, and working in space for, for such a long time, 
uh, which by the way, I never envisioned. I never thought I was gonna, I was gonna end up working in, uh, in space. I was, I was set to, to follow a very pure uh, standard academic career. Uh, for which I, I deviated. Uh, so apologies to the academic uh, community that I disappointed for not staying on that trajectory. Uh, but um, I realized uh, what a privilege it was to to work um, um, in, in in space related uh, applications because most of the time we're we're so buried or stuck in our uh, daily lives. And we don't get to think of our life, our presence on this planet uh, from the lens of space. Uh, we don't we don't think of it this way. But and I think it's 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 humbling, and at least at, uh, at the same time inspiring. So, taking you back to uh, you know the pandemic, right? For a moment in time, human activity slowed down, and without all the satellite imagery, the Earth observation imagery that we have in space, we wouldn't have been able to capture that, to capture all that stuff in human activity, you know, before and after COVID, right? Whether it's on the beaches, whether it's uh, traffic around Los Angeles area, airport activity, you know, to uh, one of the uh, biggest uh, religious centers in the world at, at Mecca. Um, Pollution levels dropped as well. Uh, this is all imagery taken from uh, NASA uh, NOAA satellites. Whether it is uh, nitrogen dioxide um, in uh, in the uh, tropospheric column, um, uh, pollution levels over uh, China or uh, Italy or, or India above. Um, again, these are the ice, what we call the, the lens of space or the ice of space, looking back at our planet and our impact as civilization on, on this planet. Um, so we gave the planet a breath and uh, a, a break and uh, the planet was able to breathe again. Uh, we, we saw so many things from, you know, the Himalayas apparently, you know, being visible because of the clear sky to uh, the many life forms that um, were able to go back and uh, feel free in their, you know, what, what was, uh, um, you know, natural habitat for them. So not only that, but, you know, amongst all these viruses, and I encourage you to, um, uh, to read this political piece. It was, it was uh, I found it very inspiring. Um, among those these virus, I think this gave us the opportunity to sit down and ask ourselves what truly matter, what truly matter, not just, you know, from a narrow day-to-day -day perspective, but uh, beyond. And in particular, in this time, in this silence, there was a moment of inspiration. I don't know how many of you remember, but last year uh, we've been, so new space took us in SpaceX in particular, took, took us to a new level where we've, we've seen the first commercial space flight to the International Space Station, a human space flight. Um, and this is transformative because again, that such an such an um, such a capability has not existed uh, before. So this hasn't always been this way. And when did it start? It started on 24th October 1946. Um, again, I'm talking about the lens of space. This is the first photo of Earth from space. Um, I hope you can see the difference, and I hope you can you can see the impact that we've uh, and and the development that emerged from just this you know set of images taken from a Vostok rocket rocket uh, launch from White Sand um, into space into what we could see today and how we could we could follow ourselves um, uh, you know on this planet and. Um, just I wanted to follow uh, along this trajectory right from then to to more recent year 2011 to 2018 that you're seeing here on the slides. Um, where we are today in the global space economy estimated to be around 360 billion dollars and that includes, you know, uh, satellite manufacturing. Um, all the satellite ground equipment, television, right? US government budget, non-US government budget, and so on. So there, there's a whole story unfolding behind this. And I, I definitely encourage you to go check the uh, Bryce um, report. Uh, we can make all these references available um, after this presentation for those of you who, those of you who are interested. But um, what we're seeing today 
uh, this this past the tipping point of uh, of of commercial space, government to commercial uh, developments um, really relies on decades of government investments, and so we're at the confluence not only uh, building on these decades of government investments, but the confluence of the space and terrestrial technologies combined with miniaturization and new areas for, such as photonics, machine learning, AI, and you know, trying for us to be being faced to reinvent, reinvent manufacturing. So we're in a, in a time of unprecedented diversification and growth of capabilities to access and utilize space. So by the numbers, just to show you, you know, a couple of things, I, I've, I've showed the Earth observation. Uh, the Earth observation was not even a market vertical. And now um, it's reached about, uh, it's, it's forecasted to reach about $8 billion by 2027. So this is a segment in new space that um, really gave uh, credibility to the fact that, you know, we can also um, think of profitable and responsible, I would say, um, uh, uh, commercialization opportunities in, in outer space. Um, so other thing is that what, what enabled that was, you know, on the left of the slide, the fact that <laughs> the small, small satellite standard has become the de facto platform for new space application, right? Miniaturization, talking about miniaturization, right? And then how people very creatively built on these one U, two U, you know, units uh, in order to either put a hyperspectral camera or a synthetic aperture radar um, up in space, or you know what we're seeing today is more uh, developing uh, satellite, satellite connectivity from from space aimed at delivering internet for all. All in one, um, between 2009 and 2018, uh, there was space startup support. So. 534 VC funds ar around the world were, are investing currently in space, and I'm sure that the number is growing. Um, so the, the number, the, the dollar value of private investments is around uh, $18 billion and, and growing. Um, while you know North America dominates the commercial launch market, um, we've seen uh, from SpaceX other uh, providers um, building and uh, testing and proving capabilities. So um, like I'm say, like I said, you know, Blue Origin is, is another one. Uh, Virgin Galactic has been extremely successful lately uh, and so on. So this diversification again is unprecedented, but where I wanna take you with this is what's next? What's the second wave of new space companies, right? Because this, these capabilities will enable us to to um, to realize this expansion, what we call the expansion in the cis lunar space, right? So we have a lot of activity in low Earth orbit um, right now. Th that's what I mean by Leo, Le low Earth orbit. Um, and we plan to go to the moon, but um, there's always that conundrum between flags, flags and footprints to a sustainable presence that Mr. Uh, Stoika was talking about. And how do we do that in a sustainable and financially affordable manner? Um, and it absolutely relies into building infrastructure in, in the space between Earth and, and Moon, which is called this, which is what we normally refer to the cis lunar space. That means that we are currently working in expanding in the infrastructure and customer base from an Earth-based one to a near Earth-based, and then, you know, again deeper into space so that whatever we build in here enables not just the uh, going to the moon or Mars, but also expanding into deeper space, you know, science and robotic missions. And as well as space manufacturing. So this brings me to space manufacturing. So we see that, you know, the price per, price per kilogram to Leo, the, the launch prices are going down. There's increased frequency of launches into space. And so the, the space manufacturing will become a central piece of the next wave of the new space economy. Uh, we've seen companies such as Made in Space um, very, doing very well in terms of uh, flying a 3D printer designed to print objects in space, which is gravity independent, as well as you know, companies such as TechShot 
uh, providing you know actual biofabrication of soft tissues in weightlessness. This is one one thing that that uh, we are looking into leveraging in space. Um, microgravity, which which uh, Dr. Prunaru talked about, the impact of microgravity on or reduced gravity on the human body, but there's actually advantages of not having the gravitational force there when you want to create new materials or when you're looking into um, applications to biotech and, and biology. <laughs> However, what we've noticed, and, and this is, you know, this is part of my journey leaving NASA and then um, I'm at my second company uh, right now. Um, what we've noticed is that we're very much stuck with thinking from the bottom of the gravity well. Not only that, but on the material science side, um, because of the demands of the digital age in uh, sensing, communication, uh, storage, um, ETC, we've wrung as much performance out of these materials as we could. And we kind of reached material use limits. So if we were to take Moore's law and apply it to you know, several other applications, we kind of, you know, we need to push the boundary beyond that. And here it is in space, a different universe of materials and physics. But the way we're approaching it is through very expensive trial and error. So um, our current thinking is very much focused on developing a hardware, space qualifying that hardware, flying it in space. Um, and we, we think of it as a hardware engineering problem when actually this is a material, it's a very deep material science problem in pushing the boundaries of phase diagrams and seeing how does gravity become uh, a variable on that phase diagram and how does that impact intimately the, the structures and the performance of these materials. So we, we needed a new paradigm and I'm gonna shift to here into G-Space because this is what we do at G-Space. We advance materials and space manufacturing. Um, the reason I'm showing our team is because it so happened that I am of Romanian origin, um, but also we have uh, two other members of the team. So, so you know, it's, it's almost half of our team members right now um, are, are Romanians, and these are, um, you know, um, extraordinary um, uh, professionals and, and uh, well-established uh, uh, credentials, and I'm very, very proud uh, to have them as, as part of my team. <coughs> so what we provide at G-Space is a first data analytics, what we call microgravity as a service um, platform. It's an AI-powered platform where instead of going again and doing microgravity product iteration in space for space manufacturing what we say what we're saying is we have a lab and software methodology and we can terrestrially uh, look at samples uh, material samples and extract the impact of the gravitational force on on very small samples so we we we, we capture that delta to gravity from material formulations to properties and performance we use that into our physics and chemistry modeling platform and machine learning algorithms. And only then after we select what is the best formulation, what is the best condition, how should we do that? Only then we go to space. And that gives us three to five times less microgravity product iteration, and it will lead towards enhanced in orbit productivity so that space manufacturing becomes profitable. Um, for example, like uh, I, I said in my in my in my like in, in my CD, one one of the um, one one area um, of current focus is ZBLAN. ZBLAN stands for zirconium boride, lanthanum, actinium, and uh, sodium. So it's a it's a really it's a mix of powders. Uh, it belongs to the class of heavy metal fluoride glasses, um, and this is one area where we're extremely strong into, where we've literally studied this material inside out from structure, property, performance, processing, characterization, and product that we have on the market, and to extract this delta to gravity and say, here's how we can push the performance of this um, of these optical fibers so that we can capture, you know, uh, several application towards you know a ten billion dollar market. The other thing that I wanted to show you here is um, on the left corner, that is an experiment run on the International Space Station, and it shows 
something that you wouldn't see terrestrially because gravity is so powerful that it overrides that phenomenon. But that phenomenon is a thermal capillary effect driven by thermal and surface tension only. And so we capture that and we look, we, we map on it uh, our data science algorithms to capture the flow uh, and extract um, important parameters for the material design, which is what we ultimately do. So we have a, a suite of, of uh, this kind of algorithms. What I wanted to also show you is on the bottom, that's a myocard fiber, so that's more in the biotech field. And uh, that my, uh, myocard fiber was actually um, built in microgravity environment. And so we're doing data science analysis mapping on that so that we can, again, we can compare uh, with and without the gravitational force what, what's, what's happening. So um, the advanced materials are just the beginning. But I wanted to take you back um, to this turning point for humanity, right? The, the, the COVID-19 cr uh, crisis, because it was an unprecedented economic, not only health crisis, but also economic crisis. And it has highlighted again and proven again the inability of capitalism to meet basic human needs. Um, because the system of profits before people has resulted in unnecessary death and suffering with no end in sight. So the question, and I've taken this from an article um, in social media, which I thought was very powerful, can we use our collective experience to advocate for a better system and for a more humane future? Ecosystems are fragile, right? An astronaut in space needs air, needs temperature, needs food, needs water, needs pressure, right? All those things, and, and we spend so much money, right, to create the, the hardware, the life support systems to provide, uh, you know, for that environment that's absolutely needed for su su uh, survival. So is planet Earth. It's the only habitable planet that gives us the right temperature, the right oxygen concentration in the air, and, you know, all these conditions to give us food and water so that we can survive. And... According to a uh, United Nations Millennium Assessment, out of these 24 uh, Earth Ecosystem Services, 17 are under severe degradation. And we refuse to acknowledge that this is a really big issue. So not only that, but we are stuck with thinking in terms of a scarcity driven and limited resource limited uh, driven world, right? We're in the middle of a, an ideological disagreement between economic growth and a sustainable future. Um, and if you think of Earth as the closed system, it's kind of difficult to, to break through that from, from that ideological uh, uh, challenge, right? Because you think, okay, we're living in a resource limited world and, and we are in a certain extent, but this is what new space opens, right? And this is one avenue that new space open and space exploration opens um, because we can start thinking and acting in rebalancing ecosystems, conserve natural resources, and at the same time, continue economic growth and most, more important, redistribute wealth. Um, I think that's, that's very, very important to see. And space manufacturing is part of that. I mean, I'm not the first one to say that we should be moving polluting manufacturing off the surface of the earth. And I want to emphasize that we want to move polluting manufacturing off the surface, but we don't want to move the polluting part of it. We want to move the manufacturing and do it in a sustainable manner because we have space solar power. We have vacuum and coal from space. This is an example of uh, a wafer manufacturing capability that was, it's called, it was called the, um, it's a, uh, 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 it was uh, deployed behind the shuttle, and the, it used atomic oxygen for molecular beam epitaxy. Uh, it's an environmental neutral, zero carbon footprint uh, manufacturing technology. And here we are on Earth, where the way we, we manufacture these wafers, right, uh, is, you know, across 150 fabs, representing 41 companies. Each integrated circuit requires 2,200 gallons of water, and the industry spends at least $1 billion constantly on uh, paying fees for water and wastewater pollution. So this is one of the, of the benefits. And so the question is, of course, a lot of you could say, well, this is science fiction. Well, okay, so what's 
humanity's um, history of bringing science fiction to reality. So let's look at the, at the space station. In 1870, it was a science fiction story in the Atlantic. It was the, the brick moon, and it was this thing that predicted that, uh, you know, human race will have an outpost uh, somewhere in Earth orbit or, you know, even, even on the moon. Um, a Romanian, Herman Orbert, actually coined the term space station in 1923. And then, you know, 28, it was the first blueprint. 1998, Zarya module launched on a Russian proto and the 2000, in 2011, ISS built was completed, and it was continuously inhabited since 2000. That took 150 years to bring science fiction to reality and to really have ISS being inhabited. But we are in an era of exponential growth in technology, robotics, software, computer science, and so on. So that 150 year timeline is now completely compressed. Um, we are working, as I, as I said, and I'm gonna give a shout out here to Ari Eisenstein. Um, he's, he's my co-founder, uh, one of my co-founders of the uh, Nexus um, Outer Space for All group. We're working uh, with, with the civil society because it is extremely important that we reach out and we talk to the next generation and we ask them, how do you see things? How do you want the future to be? Because it shouldn't be, be based on the fears of the past. It should be based on thinking and hoping for abundance for everybody, right? So we work with organizations that are talking about the overview effect, uh, a, 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 a motion, a global motion triggered by Edgar Mitchell, a 14 astronaut. Um, we work with Space for Humanity. We work with Conrad Challenges to, to encourage the next generation, um, young and, you know, uh, young and less young. Uh, we work with NASA International Space Act. So, um, I wanted to leave you with this, and the reason we're doing this is because we're we're really hoping to build together as a global community, gravity-free future through international cooperation and through leaning more into this concept of citizen of the world. So thank you so much. hear me right now so an absolutely amazing presentation uh, i must i must say that uh, you have a, an electrifying manner of of speaking congratulations so it's uh, it's, it's really amazing uh, you you tried and you succeeded in navigating us from to fulfill for our uh, um, future economics in, in, in a, uh, given an added value to the to the science and, and space exploration, and then uh, um, you pass through uh, some technical things that are specific for your activities uh, for uh, space chemistry and physics, and then uh, showed us how we should go beyond our limits and break the barriers and try to think out of the box, but not the living behind, and try to use the progress of the science just to move uh, the polluting activities in outer space in order to preserve our planet. Thank you for uh, for your presentation, and uh, thank you for uh, changing the approach uh, in our conference from your science to, to uh, commerce and uh, to uh, try to use this industry for, for economic progress. I think your presentation is the perfect uh, bridge from uh, the presentation of Dr. Stoika um, that uh, started talking about, about uh, uh, economics in science, in space science, to the presentation of Dr. Bogdan Marku. Uh, uh, I hope that, that Bogdan, uh, Dr. Marku is online. Uh, allow me to uh, say some, some things, some words about, about Dr. Marku.
who is an expert in rocket propulsion with a career of more than 25 years in the U.S. aerospace industry. A graduate of the Polytechnic Institute of Bucharest, the, uh, the Department of Aeronautical Engineering, he emigrated to the U.S. in 1991 and pursued a Ph.D. degree at the University of Southern California in Los Angeles, Department of Aerospace Engineering. After obtaining his doctorate degree in 1996, he joined the Rocketdyne Corporation in 1998, a Boeing division at the time. Over the course of 14 years at Rocketdyne, he worked on projects related to the, uh, to the Space Shuttle Main Engine, SSME, among others, a new design for the liquid hydrogen turbine flow meter introduced for flight for the first time with the Shuttle Atlantis mission in 20, 2007. During this time, he authored several studies published by the American Institute for Aeronautics and Astronautics, AIAA. In 2011, he began working for the Space Exploration Technologies, better known as SpaceX, the corporation owned by the American billionaire Elon Musk. At SpaceX, he designed the turbines operating for Merlin 1D and back D engines powering the Falcon 9 family of rockets. We all witnessed the Falcon 9 uh, flights recently. He also designed the first turbine prototypes for, the, for an early demonstrator engine of the current Raptor family of engines, expected to power the Starship's rockets on their missions to Mars. In 2016, Bogdan Marku returned to Rocketdyne as leader of the Turbine Aerodynamics Group, working again on the new version of the SSME, known as RS-25, powering the NASA Space Launch System as well as other programs. Then, in 2020, Origin Corporation, owned by the American billionaire Jeff Bezos, working on the rocket engines destined for mission to the moon. In parallel with his engineering career, Bogdan Marko developed a publishing career with several columns published in the Huffington Post. In 2011, he published the techno thriller Project Morphine, the result of his participation on the on a USAF program of training scientists to develop realistic movie scripts for the Hollywood studios. The book is sold on Amazon and he has been also translated in Romanian, published by the Pafcom Publishing House in Bucharest. Thank you, thank you Dr. Marco, for joining us uh, in our symposium. Uh, I'm looking forward to, to hear about the expansion of space-based business. You have the screen. Thank you. Thank you, Cosmin. Thank you, everyone, for joining us on this uh, conference. Uh, let me try and share my screen. Okay, I hope everyone sees the screen uh, in good order. Um, and uh, I must say, uh, uh, thank you first for the first presentation, first of all. Um, uh, cosmonaut uh, uh, Dorin Pronario, a good friend, with the introduction of what feels to be in space and the associated risks and so forth. <clears throat> and uh, then uh, Adrian, explain a little bit about, uh, well, a little bit more about the moons and the associated science and the Dr. Kozumutsa then expanded on the business uh, or the, uh, not just the business itself, but the idea of uh, uh, going in space with humanity in mind and so forth. What I'd like to do here is to uh, give you a little bit of a view uh, of what is happening today um, and the business uh, related to space. Uh, and we're talking about uh, revenue producing business, whether it's uh, private or government, we'll, we'll discuss in a second. Um, what is the dynamic in the near future? Uh, and what we think is gonna happen in the, in the next future? And again, uh, uh, most of, well, 
these are uh, my views, uh, collective of data available to uh, the public and some of the forecasts uh, together with the numbers that are public uh, associated with my own opinions. So we'll uh, look a little bit of what kind of business is producing revenue uh, in space today. Um, what's happening between uh, low Earth orbit and geosynchronous uh, orbits, which um, not to scale, but uh, low Earth orbit are orbits that are very close to the Earth, uh, just above the 100 kilometers uh, uh, approximate boundary, which is the atmosphere. Then uh, there is a, a small class of satellites operating in the medium Earth orbit, and uh, the satellites that were uh, used traditionally for uh, communications and mostly television are operating what we call geosynchronous orbits. They are much further away from, from Earth as uh, depicted here. And uh, th they have the ability of rotating together with the surface in the Earth rotation such that they look down always at the same spot. And they are obviously useful with, with a couple, three or four of these satellites. You can count most of the Earth. Um, so, obviously a, a good business opportunity for, for communications. Then we're gonna take a look at deep space potential and resources that exist and are needed. The emerging business that go uh, beyond uh, LEO and GEO, some forecasts, technology uh, use, usage and technology necessities and requirements to the expansion of business in space and future. So uh, currently, the businesses that produce pure revenue, pure commercial revenue, are essentially uh, next to the earth, satellites. We use them for communications, broadband, media, entertainment, um, observation, uh, prospection of uh, resources, and so forth, pure commercial. Uh, a, a, there's operators of satellites, they sell their services, there are businesses buying these services and they produce revenue. Then uh, there is a mixed uh, type of business, uh, still private, but uh, with some of the revenue coming from government coffers. Uh, uh, weather observations are sold uh, both to the public corporations for various commercial forecasts, but as well as the government. Uh, the same with global positioning. We're all familiar with GPS, navigation and timing. Also, and then there are special communications, either uh, businesses that want uh, faster uh, financial connections or a military that wants uh, very good uh, communications, uh, reliable all over the earth. And then finally, government. We know military, special communications, and then anything that we see on the news uh, regarding uh, Mars, uh, including the recent rover, um, Perseverance, uh, all human crew missions are being paid for, not necessarily executed, but paid for by government. Um, the more recent um, uh, SpaceX uh, manned missions to the International Space Station were on government budgets. We will soon, not yet, we will soon need, uh, see the human crew missions either by um, uh, essentially tourist uh, type of attractions or even some technical science executed by private um, corporations uh, such as SpaceX, but not quite yet. The overall uh, revenue is seen here. It's, it's, it's inching towards a, about $300 billion a year um, profit. This is a, a uh, revenue for, uh, for profit companies, wherever, wherever the money comes from. Uh, but we'll see uh, in a minute that the uh, prospects are much higher than this. So what about satellites? I think we're all uh, pretty much familiar with uh, these services. 
I don't think we could uh, spend uh, in in uh, our day to day lives uh, one uh, hour without interacting with the satellite. You could see we even right now we're using the services to discuss with each other. We're interconnected uh, via broadcast services or um, uh, connectivity at the last minute, or whether we're talking to the um, proxim uh, pr proximity uh, towers or proximity uh, hubs of internet. In the end, such a hub interacts with the satellite. Uh, the infrastructure is quite mature. Uh, we have uh, around, we'll see in a minute num some numbers. We have about 2,000 satellites in orbit right now and they support everything we do every day. How, just how many are there in space? Uh, and what's the dynamic? From the beginning of uh, space uh, era in the early 1950s with Sputnik, uh, up to about last year, uh, we have launched around 5,000 to 6,000 satellites, out of which only about 2,000 were operating, 2,500 or so uh, were operational um, in at the beginning of 2020. You see the uh, this statistic here that USA is by far the operator of most satellites in space, uh, followed by China, multinational, Russia, and so forth. But there is a new dynamic happening. And I'm pointing it out with a uh, this green bar, which is roughly to scale with the rest of the statistics. From April 2020 until about uh, two weeks ago, SpaceX has launched about 1,100 satellites in space. So as much, almost as much satellites as the uh, United States had until one year ago, are now uh, newly present in space. The ambition of, of SpaceX is to launch um, a, a constellation initially of about 4,200 satellites that will um, cover about 90% of the surface of the Earth uh, because uh, there is in, in this broadband services and access to internet, um, there is a common number that uh, uh, statistics are quoting. That is, about 50% of the world population is still not connected to the internet, and including in here in the uh, United States, there are large swaths of land which are uh, connected only via slow service such as DSL and so forth. So the ambition of SpaceX with the Starlink uh, network is to cover all these areas and uh, uh, cap capture essentially a uh, broadband direct internet market. But it's important to notice this dynamic uh, because it inscribes into a larger picture of the uh, new era of space uh, dawning today. Um, to uh, continue, with more details about this uh, satellite, here's a more detailed information about where low Earth orbit is. We're flying uh, on a normal airplane going uh, back to Bucharest or to London or anywhere else, uh, right here close to the Earth at about uh, uh, 30,000 feet. Anything above 100 kilometers is considered space. And this region of uh, between 100, 100 to about 400 to 500 ki uh, kilometers is considered low Earth orbit. Traditionally, uh, the communications were not as um, common done here because uh, as I explained before, uh, it was preferred to place a satellite into geo uh, orbit because it would see the low Earth all the time from the same uh, distance, and with three, four satellites would cover the entire Earth. Um, however, uh, you could not have a communication that was go that goes both ways. Um, there were special antennas and very large antennas required for from Earth to pick up on the uh, signal from such a distant satellite, and obviously an equally big antenna to broadcast. Uh, to those satellites. 
in order to obtain individual access to broadband, that is, each household uh, get a small antenna on the roof or, or outside and start interacting with the satellites. You have to be very close to the earth, hence the idea of uh, placing uh, these new LEO satellites. But you need a very large number of them. Uh, here is a, an image of the spots that are projected on the Earth's surface by the early 300 satellites of Starlink. And you could see these, 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 ra these round blue spots that the satellites is projecting on the Earth uh, have uh, quite a, a few gaps in between them. And therefore, the needed larger number uh, for uh, this communication. However, they are close enough so that uh, the communication is both ways. They broadcast something to us, and as we type commands on the computer, our antenna uh, transmits the, the signal back, and the satellite responds with whatever request we're doing. Uh, there is also another problem, uh, because the satellites are so close to the Earth, in order to stay on orbit, they are uh, uh, navigating at very large velocities. So therefore, if we watch an eight minute video on YouTube via such a satellite service, uh, we will be talking with several satellites during all that eight minute period because within uh, a couple of minutes, they are coming and going over the horizon above our houses. Therefore, not only a large number of satellites needed, but a very sophisticated and maybe artificial intelligence driven um, algorithms of communications of how to pass millions of millions of subscribers between uh, so many other satellites and maintain the service solid, uninterrupted, and, uh, uh, and fluid. So, uh, so much with low Earth orbit. We'll look at the uh, numbers and dynamics in, in, in a minute. How about reaching beyond the low Earth orbit, what we call the deep space? Um, one good measure, and I like statistics, uh, is to look at, uh, first of all, how many countries have been to the moon? Moon, uh, as Adrian uh, explained, is uh, given to us by the universe, or by God, or who, whatever the belief is, um, as a um, extremely valuable resource that we can reach in three days worth of space flight, uh, uh, establish a base, practice our flights if we want to uh, reach further with human crews, and otherwise uh, exploit the local resources. As you could see, the United States with the um, unmanned probed Apollo mission uh, landings and uh, orbit missions only, these are a cumulative number of missions, have reached the moon by about 30 times. Uh, Russia, uh, USSR is not far behind with 23. China, now it's at its seventh um, and the last one very successful landings uh, with um, uh, robotic explorations. Japan has placed two probes and then followed by your European Union, India, and Luxembourg. Um, deeper than the moon are and more um, challenging to reach is the uh, obviously Mars. Mars has um, uh, inflated our imagination and, and expectations. Um, not only Elon Musk is the, the newest uh, uh, person to really pursue this objective, but uh, from uh, uh, the a cultural point of view, I remember Ray Bradbury, one of my favorite authors, with his uh, series of uh, stories about Mars. Um, these infographics, which I tried to complete here on the lower part, because I, I can only find one uh, going all the way through uh, 2020, is looking at Mars, uh, missions towards Mars uh, in an in increasing uh, temporal uh, perspective uh, from uh, top to lower right, so counterclockwise. And what is interesting to follow uh, is to see how many red failures 
are marked in that map in the early uh, days of uh, attempted Mars explorations, whether we try just a flyby or landing and so forth. Um, overall, uh, the best uh, reliability are, have, um, are the US missions. Overall, about 75% with the newest additions, but lately 100%. But also, lately, you can see here uh, only an occasional failure. Even the newcomers, such as uh, European Space Age Agency or Japan, India, uh, also United Arab Emirates and China, they all have reached 100% reliability. That is uh, one try, one success. This is very important because it shows a maturity of technology and the ability of humanity to, to uh, reach deep space um, in more reliable way than ever before. With regards to the moon, prospecting the resources of the moon has been going on even from before Apollo, but following Apollo with a lot of unmanned probes and more recently, obviously, by the, this, this two Chinese missions. Um, in this picture here on the right, you see the uh, uh, a map of the moon, a unified geological map of the moon, is created by the astrology, uh, astro, astro geology, not astrology. <laughs> so it's a science, not a, a pseudoscience. It's a purely science and very valuable science center uh, where uh, you could access this uh, via the internet. It's a very detailed map uh, which is color coded in various minerals that are available for now on the surface of the moon. The Chinese um, uh, probes U-2-1, uh, the little rabbit, one and two, are also using a radar to penetrate the ground at about 100 miles and extract more information. What we want from this is to uh, evaluate very uh, accurately what is it that we can get uh, from the moon, what can support uh, our missions to the moon, uh, our future bases to the moon, and so forth. What is available to the moon and that's uh, uh, considered very valuable to uh, the uh, to the Earth civilization? If, if we could, for instance, uh, use it there in situ or bring it back. For now, there are three um, categories of, of uh, resources that are uh, quoted. Uh, it's water, helium-3, and rare earth elements. And, uh, there are various, very optimistic uh, assessments of this. So if you read the specialized papers, uh, you could see that uh, while these three elements are uh, detected and uh, confirmed to be present on the moon, um, to get there and begin uh, uh, extracting and utilizing these three resources is not a slam dunk. First of all, water has been confirmed first by uh, Chandrayaan-1 Indian mission in 2018, uh, confirmed by NASA in 2020, and uh, Adrian Stoika had uh, offered quite a bit of detail about that. However, there is not a confirmed uh, large quantity available in one single spot, as far as I could uh, read from the uh, sources consulted. The moon is still 100%, I'm sorry, 100 times drier than the Sahara Desert. So from that uh, 10 tons of water daily that Adrian was quoting, it is not exactly simple to uh, uh, locate and extract them from the moon. We're still uh, prospecting from that. That's what the Chinese probes are doing. That's what some of our uh, American probes are doing as well. For now, we're still searching. The helium-3 isotope is a very special uh, element. Uh, the uh, lunar dust, the lunar regolith, as they call it, basically a, a collection of very fine 
rocky particles that cover the moon on its entire surface has been bombarded by billions of years with protons from the sun uh, radiation and have accumulated this particular isotope of helium. Um, there are uh, theoretical uh, works, uh, but not yet a practical realization that a, a, a fusion reactor that would employ helium-3 isotope, helium-3 plus deuterium um, is speculated or, or uh, uh, predicted theoretically that could um, allow a more, an easier, so to speak, a fusion reaction than uh, with hydrogen and, and some other uh, models that we're using on Earth. If such a reactor would be successful, 25 tons of helium-3 could power the United States for a year. And the deposits are estimated on the moon of about more than a million tons. So if we are to begin transporting this helium on the earth and, and begin producing energy, we would have energy for many years to come. However, uh, the technology of bringing 25 tons per uh, year um, on Earth is not uh, clearly not here yet and not anticipated to have uh, within a decade or so. Finally, rare, rare Earth elements, uh, there is again indirect evidence. There are significant deposits uh, um, evaluated at about 200 to 400 billion tons. These are elements that are being used in all high technology, electronics, batteries, and so forth. On Earth, most of the production is located in China. Um, there are deposits in the United States, but these are hard to, to, to mine. However, uh, the expense of, first of all, finding these, there is no evidence yet suggested that you can find a concentration of a given spot that you could basically excavate and carry to Earth. So it's a little bit more complicated than that. So I anticipate that most uh, funds will go towards um, Earth investment rather than uh, going up from the moon. Going even deeper in space, there is the asteroid belt. And by asteroid belt, we're referring mostly to the main asteroid belt, which lies between the orbit of Mars and Jupiter. There is also the Trojan asteroid uh, belt, uh, which is further away. And um, although uh, these objects are uh, shown here as in a construct, circle concentric to the uh, Earth orbit. In fact, the, the, the orbits of these asteroids are uh, uh, elliptic and they um, rotate in a precession manner in various ways that uh, are bringing them at some uh, time of the year closer to the Earth. Um, over the years, we were able to survey and classify this uh, objects in these three types. So um, asteroid could be of C-type, um, which are mostly important for water. They could con can uh, contain a large amount of water. Finally, that uh, uh, water is the goal of space. If you get w massive amounts of water in space, you can get oxygen, you can get hydrogen, propellant, air, and so, uh, and so forth. There is the M-type, that's the gold rush uh, objective. Metallic type, um, some speculation are that these are the result of uh, um, space catastrophes of uh, uh, planet collisions where the core and the nucleus of a planet has been uh, stripped away and, and, and exposed to the uh, 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 vacuum. There are other uh, theories about that. Uh, but essentially, these are roughly big boulders in space that are 99% metal containing nickel, iron, cobalt, and mostly platinum. And there is the S-type, which are essentially uh, a rocky type with just a, a rich content of these uh, same uh, metals. Uh, because of this potential 
uh, richness and potential gold space, uh, gold rush in space, uh, the asteroid belt is being prospected as we speak. You see maps like this uh, that are approximate and then get more and more detail. We will talk about the startups from this domain and then we'll, we'll see that most of their efforts are, are uh, focused on getting more and more information of, uh, uh, and survey about this um, near Earth asteroids. Um, there are over a million asteroids and about 200 of them that are uh, 60 miles or, or larger. And then you see all these numbers here. From NASA estimates, you have 700 billions of billions of dollars of material available to us in the asteroid belt at current material costs. For example, uh, this is the darling of the, of the news, 16 Psyche. It's a metallic type, massive, and it has a lot of resources of iron and nickel, and also uh, potentially platinum. It's worth 10,000 quadrillion and so forth. These are numbers that are an abstraction to us because it means so much. They're so massively rich in, in resources that obviously uh, have attracted so much attention. Another example, uh, an asteroid called uh, 3554 Amin, two kilometers in size for a mass of 30 billion tons, also metallic type. It's compared that with an annual production. We're, we're producing on Earth uh, iron and nickel worth about 340 billion, cobalt worth about 1.3 billion, and platinum about $12 billion a year. On Amion, this space, this rock in space, there's a there's a content of about worth of about eight thousand billions in today's current prices, about six thousand billions in cobalt, and six thousand billions uh, of platinum. Obviously, uh, if we are to bring uh, materials back from the asteroid, we need to test how to do that. And the first mission to attempt that was uh, uh, Hiabusa from Japan. The very first uh, attempt to bring some material back from, a, from an asteroid. Um, it took off, launched in 2003 and returned to Earth in 2010. It was mostly a technology demonstrator. We wanted to see if we could do it, first of all. Um, it's the first landing and takeoff from the surface of, a, of an asteroid, which was 35143 Tokawa. Uh, if you read the uh, uh, Odyssey of this uh, uh, little probe, Hayabusa had experienced a lot of failures. So, uh, the inertial navigation system was lo losing uh, re beats, redundant parts one by one. Uh, nevertheless, they managed to return one gram of asteroid material back to Earth. Um, the total cost, including launch, operation in space, and landing, 150 million. The second uh, is still ongoing. It's a mission called Osiris Rex from NASA, launched uh, five years ago, uh, October 2016. It's a um, target, it's uh, uh, the an asteroid called uh, 101955 Benno. It's a carbo carbonaceous type. Uh, we hope to find water in there and in that uh, content. Um, you may have noticed uh, in the news it was a successful sampling not too far ago in October 2020. And you could see here the pictures. This is the Benno. Uh, it roughly the size of uh, the Empire State, State Building and a bit larger than the Eiffel Tower in, that, in, in terms of diameter. This is the, the uh, container that uh, stored the very first uh, material um, sucked from the Beno surface. This, was, uh, this mission was almost like a mosquito that didn't really land, but just touched uh, the surface of Beno, uh, sucked some uh, material and uh, was prepared to take off, except this um, uh, 
cover was left open and the pressures samples uh, uh, obtained from the surface were escaping in space. And finally, um, the team managed to close it and were bringing back home about 60 grams of uh, material. Overall, this is expected to cost about uh, a little bit over a billion dollars, about $1.2 billion. So obviously one order of magnitude higher than Hiabusa. There is finally a mission planned for 16 Psyche uh, that very rich and, and attractive uh, metallic type uh, asteroid plan in 2023. Um, there are uh, a lot of business prospects in startups that are associated with this asteroids. And I'm quoting a couple of them here, and, and they, but they're, they're in the hundreds uh, of various startups of various um, sizes. You'll see Planetary Resource Corporation. It's uh, reorganized and acquired by Consent Systems, which essentially is a software and, and um, a blockchain corporations. But it's um, it, employing nanosats that are small, very small satellites and attempting to do a, a better survey of uh, asteroids. It has about uh, 51 million in, in funding from 24 investors, 60 employees. Another corporation is uh, Deep Space Industries, uh, founded in 2013. Uh, they were two acquired by a larger uh, corporation in 2019. Um, again, they are developing low cost access to higher orbit technologies and attempt to survey. Not as much funding, 4 million. What's interesting, Asteroid Mining Corporation, it's a UK corporation 20 employees, but they are uh, designing um, probes in a, a judicious approach where they want to launch one in 2023 to do a prospecting, pretty much like Kiabusa um, or uh, Osiris Rex. Then uh, they want to launch a probe where you could uh, bring back some, some uh, sample material in, in larger quantity to be launched in 2027. And finally, uh, they are not joking, they, they, they are designing a project mu asteroid uh, mining, but essentially a ship that would be able, according to them, to return 20 tons of platinum from uh, that mission to be launched in 2035. So many others, Momentus, uh, uh, Moon Express and so forth, and for this reason, you see finance firms like Goldman Sachs and Morgan Stanley have already opened funds uh, specialized in, in investment in, in space. There's a recent uh, Barron's uh, article about the new space wave to be uh, written and how to invest and so forth. But what is the uh, forecast? in more exact terms. I, I mentioned Morgan Stanley. Uh, here on the uh, right-hand side of the chart is a uh, forecast in, in large detail done by Morgan Stanley, which appreciates is that the space economy revenue will reach about 1.1 trillions by 2040. There are others even more optimistic uh, expectations uh, quoting about $2 trillion. Um, what is interesting to notice is that these little light green numbers right here, they are called here uh, in the legend as second order impacts. So what is this? It is associated with this forecast of about 50 to 70% growth for broadband services. That is, that lowers uh, orbit system that uh, SpaceX is deploying and then uh, Amazon is going to deploy as well. Uh, OneWeb and some other corporations are coming from behind. Uh, although OneWeb is in bankruptcy, it's expected to recover and, and uh, get back to business. As soon as you provide so much broadband 
to essentially everyone on Earth, then there is an effect that's called second order impact. You will find also the expression digital spillover. That means as people have access to broadband and communications, they will start having other business initiatives that are uh, enabled by their broadband access, but not exactly directed, uh, directly related to that broadband or not anyway. Um, for instance, Huawei, the Chinese uh, 5G and, and, and mobile uh, communication company has, um, uh, speculated that the impact of this spill over digital um, effect is about two and a half times in revenue than the initial investment in hardware. Okay. And you could see that uh, Morgan Stanley is banking on this by uh, in, uh, very strongly increased dynamic. Um, Another example of such a thing is the more recent um, contract between the SES uh, satellite company based in Luxembourg and the IBM cloud. They have a contract and uh, customers of the SES are uh, essentially guaranteed fast access to the IBM cloud fast access to uh, optimization and artificial intelligence services for whatever modeling they need to do, and also fast access to financial uh, transaction and communications. So uh, all this shows that uh, there is a uh, amplifying dynamic of the uh, satellite services near earth communications that will uh, occur. Um, another impact is the emergence of uh, smaller launchers, uh, corporations that are not as big as SpaceX or Blue Origin, but you, you, you've heard of Rocket Lab. There is Relativity uh, founded by two former students of mine that uh, these rockets are dropping in price, uh, price per rocket and price per launch and they are targeting niche satellites within 500 kilograms, uh, give or take, which will uh, be launched on very specialized orbit and participate in the development of this particular set of communications. How about the moon? Um, some of my opinions is that, uh, supported by, by what I'm reading, uh, as an announcement of, of, of plans uh, by various uh, parties. Within 20 years, we will have moon uh, bases with humans. Um, and inherently, we will have early mining in support for the moon bases. I don't think helium-3 uh, will be brought to Earth. If helium-3 fusion is going to be successful, I see more of a... Uh, 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 us taking the re reactor to the moon rather than uh, bringing 25 tons per year of uh, helium-3 to, to, to Earth. The asteroid mining, it's still far away in the future. Uh, what we're seeing today are the very first baby steps in trying to assess uh, what we can or cannot do, but definitely it's an attraction. And once a mission like the third mission of uh, uh, um, Astro, uh, uh, what is the name? <laughs> Asteroid Mining Corporation, okay, there are so many of them. If they are successful, even in part, by bringing a big load of platinum, that's gonna generate such a gold rush in space similar to the 1849 in California. Um, however, uh, there is, a more realism coming into play when you're talking about very large quantities, because if you dump 100 tons of platinum in one year, a period of time on Earth, then obviously the market and the costs of platinum is going to crash. So therefore is a uh, chicken and the egg effect 
large quantities of platinum would de depreciate the price to the point where there is a somewhere a balance of the capital to be invested and uh, profits to be made. So in that respect, deep space business will evolve gradually. We will see some quantities being brought uh, to earth and then we will see also in the meantime a large um, space infrastructure being slowly developed depending on how the dynamic is going to adjust the reality of the time. In order to do that, we also need to improve our launchers. And my specialty is propulsion and, and I worked on some of the systems that you see here. Uh, think a bit, five, 60 years ago, 50 plus years ago, um, Saturn V was the queen of rockets with 140 tons uh, ability of payloads to low Earth orbit. Uh, we're not there yet, uh, so many years after that. Uh, N1 never flew. It took a couple of uh, attempts followed by dramatic explosions and it's gone. SLS Block 2 is uh, approaching what 130 tons, and I believe in the in the uh, second uh, improvements is going to reach again 140 tons. Right now, SLS Block 1, for which you saw just a, last week, uh, the eight-minute test of the uh, first stage, massive, massive uh, thr uh, thrust. It's still lower than 100 tons. Then uh, the Chinese are developing the long March 9 with 140 tons. Um, then you have these other rockets. Um, we need even larger capacities. We need to lift 200 to 50 tons to, to lower orbit. Um, and for this, we need uh, new propulsion, even larger than what we're developing right now and or uh, vehicle configuration and control where even if we don't have a large uh, engine uh, by itself, we are uh, able to uh, uh, burn and operate more of them, such as Falcon Heavy is operating 27 engines at once. Then um, we need to bring the cost down and bring some start on this standardization. Everybody right now from all these new developers are using uh, their own designs, and none one design is uh, the same as the other. Um, we will witness an improved infrastructure in space, uh, which includes the Moon and Mars, with all these launchers and the ability to uh, lift up uh, materials. We'll need modular structures, pretty much like the International Space Station was assembled after multiple space uh, shuttle launches, the same future uh, infrastructure will be modular and assembled in space, but uh, we we'll need more, we we'll, we'll need to deposit propellant, which are uh, require special technologies, and also uh, generate uh, repairs uh, in space for ships that will stay in space for many years. These are the space stocks that's being anticipated with also, again, new propulsion systems, um, unlikely to be chemical, most, most likely electric propulsion. And then if we are to uh, achieve uh, an asteroid-based space economy, um, and if the uh, metals are not pure metal, just to uh, slice in there and carry home, we might need to, pull, to process some of this in space uh, and, and carry it. It will be more effective. And as uh, uh, Dr. Kozmutsa said, we will have space based manufacturing for parts that are mostly needed in space and they're too expensive to uh, be brought from Earth over and over again. We need space based power with various ideas. Uh, here's an idea from a good friend of mine uh, who founded Virtus Solis Incorporated. There are other ideas similar from European Space Agency. Large arrays of satellites with um, uh, uh, solar panels and then connected to very specialized antennas that can beam that energy either on Earth or away from Earth on, uh, on the moon, pretty, again, pretty much like Adrian was saying. Um, 
Also, uh, there is new uh, uh, momentum and uh, call for proposals from the Department of Energy uh, for new generation of fission based technology. Good old fission um, reactors, but new, safe, modular, and also very reliable to operate in space. Plus, the future prospect of fusion reactors, whether helium 3 or, or not powered as a fuel. In terms of geopolitics, uh, the United States have been uh, supreme in space for 50 plus years, but uh, in the last decade, we've seen how ambitious and tenacious actors are coming from behind. China has a consistent effort. Uh, you could see the successful Chang'e missions. There are five of them uh, successful with their orbiters or, and two landings, and they have even uh, three more planned. China is operating low Earth orbit space stations where they practice uh, human presence in space. And then they have one shot, one success for orbiter around Mars, Tianwen-1, with a planned landing uh, in, in a couple of uh, months from now. India uh, had some partial success to the moon, but 100% uh, mission to uh, success in mission to Mars. Their probe is on Mars orbit. And um, what is remarkable about India is that uh, they have a very low cost development of space technology. Um, uh, there was a uh, interesting comparison on the internet that their uh, mission to Mars cost less than the making of the mov movie, The Martian, okay? Finally, European uh, agency and Russia as well. From the basic legal framework and agreements, uh, governments uh, refrain uh, to some extent from uh, going too aggressively in land grading in space, uh, whether Moon or Mars. However, uh, according to the current framework, private corporations are allowed to access space mineral and resources at will. For now, is the far west in space for whomever can manage the capital and the technology to go there. So, in summary, uh, we're 50 plus years after Apollo, and finally, after a, a decades long lull, there is a new space age that appears to be forming. Um, in the next future, we'll see mostly businesses to operate in low Earth orbit and uh, maybe uh, geo orbits um, with all the Earth-based services that I mentioned. There is a strong potential growth um, with this uh, a disturbingly large, I would say, uh, number of satellites in low Earth orbit, because you'd ask yourself, well, how can you get into space without knocking one down or so? Uh, the deep space exploration remains government-supported effort for now, with some incipient uh, uh, private effort and then uh, there is participation of commercial flights. For instance, SpaceX has uh, obtained a contract to uh, supply uh, the gateway station around the moon with materials. But the moon and, and orbit and the moon surface stations would be essentially uh, paid for by the government. We see Mars human missions within a decade. I don't think it's gonna be any sooner than that. And uh, in terms of this space, we see a very early, very um, encouraging uh, dawn light, but still not uh, very close. So in the next generation, we will see then probably the very first richness made in space uh, based on asteroid gold. All these business and economic models will need obviously adjustment because uh, we will see that not every household on Earth will afford a direct link to Star, uh, Starlink. Um, you cannot bring uh, thousands of tons of platinum and gold to Earth and still maintain the prices. But, it, uh, you know, pay, pay as you go, adjust as you go models are likely to come. And this is pretty much what I wanted to say today. Thank you for your attention. I've added here a 
uh, page for uh, sources. Uh, I'll leave it on the screen a little bit uh, for the recording and whoever is uh, interested to uh, search further uh, after this talk. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Marku. Thank you for your synthetic, but at the same time, very comprehensive uh, presentation, a presentation that practically continued the things that uh, were opened by Dr. Stoika uh, with the uh, exploitation of the moon, exploration and exploitation of the moon, and uh, uh, the business development uh, models that, uh, that Dr. Kosmuta uh, described uh, um, previously. Um, you brought into discussion the, con the huge constellation of, uh, of, of satellites put on the sky by private uh, investors. You also brought into discussion how uh, the moon is going to help us, but also how uh, uh, belt of trade uh, exploration is going to is going to uh, bring a lot of resources for for, uh, for us on the earth. Uh, also, you uh, told us a thing that marked me uh, that uh, the gold of the space is water, and that uh, regulation needs to be needs to be done in order to avoid any kind of conflict in space, and that uh, uh, builds the bridge towards the presentation, the next presentation of the president of Romanian Space Agency, uh, Dr. Maris Ioan Piso. Because we can see that governments are not important only for funding uh, space exploration and travel, but also for the building legal systems in order to regulate everything that happens out there in order to avoid conflicts in the space. Let me tell you some uh, some uh, some uh, facts about about Dr. Uh, Marius Juan Piso, who is uh, an executive director of the Romanian Space Agency since 1996. And president and the CEO of, of this organization things, uh, since 2004. Dr. Pizzo is a University Babesh Boy Cluj Napoca graduate in 1982 with a diploma in gravitational radiation and became doctor in physics of, of, of the University of uh, uh, Alexander Ioan Kuza from Yash in 1994 with a thesis on quantum space time structure. He started his career as a research scientist in the ICPE Bucharest in 1983, the National Institute for Research. Then he continued as the head of laboratory in 1990 and reserve professor in 1999 at the Institute of Space Science Bucharest. Dr. Piso has become university professor in 1999 as first degree research scientist at the Institute of Atomic Physics in Bucharest. President Marius Piso is the Romanian representative in various committees and boards involving space, aeronautics, and security research of the European Union. He participated to the process of drafting the first European space policy in 2003. He was a member of the European Security Research and Innovation Forum and in the program committees of the framework program six and seven of the European Union. Since 2004, he is the representative of Romania in the NATO Space for Peace and Security Committee. Since 1994, Dr. Pizzo is the representative and head of the delegation of Romania to the United Nations Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space, being the incumbent chairman and, uh, of the committee for 2020-2022 period. Dr. Pizzo has been elected as a member of the International Astronautical Academy and as a member of the Board of Trustees since 2007, present serving as vice president of the European Academy of Science Pair and since 2007 the Romanian principal for the group of Earth observation. Dr. Pizzo managed the, success, the successful accession of Romania as a member state of the European Space Agency, a two decades process being the head of the Romanian delegation to ESA since then. Dr. Pizzo has been elected Dr. Honoris Causa of several universities. As a recognition of his achievements, the asteroid 1981 ET7 was named after his name, Marius Yuan. Dr. Pizzo, it is an honor to have you here with us 
Thank you for taking our invitation. The floor now is yours. Thank you, Consul General Dumitrescu, for the presentation. And I will deduce the time from uh, my time. I'm trying to share the content. No, please, will, uh, the, entire, the entire presentation. Yes. I will. Uh, the previous speakers, they gave uh, nice uh, descriptions and presentations of their fields of uh, activity. I will uh, try to concentrate on some uh, facts. I think you can see the presentation now. Yes, I will concentrate yes. on some facts of what's happening on a more uh, on a smaller, uh, let's say, portion of uh, the surface of our planet in uh, Romania and in uh, its neighborhoods. So, the Romanian Space Agency is an old organization now has been established in 1995. It's uh, the National Space Agency. It is uh, the financing agency for research in space, aeronautics, and security. Also, ROSA is coordinating some national bodies in uh, regarding industry, research, and security. And also, ROSA is the national representative for the European Space Agency. We called it ESA. I must mention that Romania is the second former, former socialist country admitted uh, in ESA after Czech Republic. ROSA has uh, different, uh, most of the space related governmental attributions regarding the European Union, regarding the United Nations, regarding uh, NATO, regarding uh, the international organizations, governmental and non governmental, with uh, businesses and uh, the uh, several bilateral agreements with the national agencies. The cooperation with the US, I will give uh, a few milestones. Uh, we started uh, after the 89s, we restarted the cooperation, uh, let's say at the end of the 90s and uh, in 2000, we concluded uh, some uh, MOUs with NASA on fields as uh, space science, microgravity, precision farming, telemedicine. Also, uh, in 2005, uh, we cooperated with the US and with other seven nations, but US was the main sponsor, to establish in NATO the Space Science and Technology Advisory Group. And the first meeting, the first specialist meeting has been organized in Bucharest. In 2006, it was a classified meeting. Now we can speak about and we were very glad to organize it in Bucharest. In the same time, very sad that we could not speak about. Then, uh, since 2011, Romania became a full member of the European Space Agency, and uh, we uh, moved and we started new cooperations with uh, the U.S. in the frame of the of ESA. So part of the ESA agreements with NASA and with other organizations, other space related organizations in uh, the US are performed, uh, uh, include Romania. We had some high level meetings in 2014 and uh, 2019. But in 2014, uh, we uh, started, uh, negotiated and started the participation to the International Space Station. In 2018, we concluded with the, then it was U.S. STRATCOM, uh, actually U.S. SPACECOM, an MOU regarding cooperation in the space uh, 
in space traffic management, in space surveillance and tracking. And uh, since 2007, we were included, uh, not all these are countries were included, were included uh, in the Artemis Agreement signed between NASA and uh, ESA. I will try to give you some facts regarding our strategy. This strategy is uh, has been uh, developed in uh, 2017 and uh, by chance it has been presented for the first time in 2018 in uh, Colorado Springs with the opportunity of uh, the large uh, space symposium where we have been invited to speak in the opening panel for three or four times. So this uh, strategy uh, is based on uh, developing science and technology, which are the main engine for other areas. Science and technology includes uh, space exploration. Then uh, services, space is, uh, uh, is offering services as uh, telecommunications, as earth observation, as navigation, as uh, positioning navigation timing, used in integrated applications for disaster medicine, for disaster management, for meteor, for telemedicine, and for many other things. And uh, the third S means uh, security. Security is uh, security from space and security for space. We are speaking about uh, space situational awareness. We're speaking about uh, space surveillance and tracking. Uh, also uh, to, uh, let's say, uh, homeland and uh, uh, military defense security. And uh, we should think that we are living on a planet where a new civilization and uh, uh, there are many threats coming from the universe and for some of them we are able to develop tools. To uh, protect the civilization. I will give some uh, quick facts. I concentrated, I changed a bit my presentation to introduce uh, some of uh, what's happening in Romania. There are some space missions in the area of space of the first test. We are participating to the uh, Euclid mission, which is a large uh, mission developed by ESA. It is a space telescope devoted for dark matter. And uh, we are building parts of the ground and uh, onboard uh, segment uh, components. The Institute of May Science of Space Science is the main actor here. Then the Planck mission of ESA, which was also devoted. We are one of the, let's say, uh, significant part of the Planck mission. Then uh, we are working now for LISA. LISA is a complicated mission devoted to the det detection and measurement of uh, gravitational radiation. It is, uh, let's say, a competitor to the US development uh, for ground measurement by laser interferometry. This is a space interferometer, a triangle, uh, first, it has been described in the 80s. Now the mission has been approved by ESA and uh, probably it will be launched at the horizon of uh, 2032. Then, an exploration, we're building some parts of the JUICE mission. JUICE means uh, Jupiter ice. It is uh, devoted to the study of the icy moons of the universe. Then we are coming to services. So the most important service uh, to reach space, you should uh, cross the atmosphere and uh, you should launch the, the spacecraft. And we are part of the European uh, launchers uh, developments. As you can see, uh, the Romanian flag is one of the 12 flags on the new uh, European launcher, it's the Ariane 6. 
Uh, we are also developer for the uh, Space Rider. Space Rider is the will be the automatic uh, space shuttle developed by the European Space Agency. Then the Vega C. Vega C is a, a small launcher where Romania is. Uh, Italy, and it is called uh, the Ferrari of launchers because it is very good but very expensive. Then uh, this is a genuine Romanian uh, development. It's called uh, Adam P. This is a uh, uh, let's say a spacecraft for uh, ascending and descending on uh, uh, other celestial bodies as the moon and mars it is a special program within the european space agency general technology program gstp uh, devoted to adam p and uh, this is one of our let's say uh, pride we will probably manage to compete with the spacex when uh, landing on uh, uh, the uh, oil platforms. Then, uh, because we're speaking about launchers, we developed a base uh, on the Black Sea border for high altitude uh, experiments. And probably in the future, we will try to launch um, micro or nano satellites from this base. We're going, I am, uh, we're going now to services in Earth observation. Uh, we're part of the Altius satellite, which is an uh, atmospheric limb tracker for investigation of the upcoming stratosphere. Then uh, the Truth, this is a, a radiometric system for uh, terrestrial and uh, solar studies. We also are speaking about the meteoro meteorological satellite. This is uh, METOP SG, the European component of the Common Polar System, a cooperation between US, UMETSAT, and uh, ESA. Then in the uh, European Union Finance Program Copernicus, we are working uh, for the new uh, Sentinel-6 satellite, which is uh, basically radar altimetry. Uh, the Copernicus Sentinel satellite and the services uh, which are utilized by more and more uh, downstream uh, space uh, industry then in the i can give you two examples of the projects we developed for utilizing copernicus information the uh, monitoring of uh, deforestation there is an issue in europe and in the world to monitor the illegal uh, cuttings in uh, forests also, we uh, are able since uh, more than 10 years to measure with uh, sub millimetric precision the heights, the evolution of the, the subsidence of uh, the terrestrial surface. Uh, there are good applications and uh, good contracts with uh, nuclear power plants and with uh, dams and with other large facilities, but also with the cities. Then I gave you another example in the services area, utilizing uh, Navstar GPS and uh, Galileo information. We are uh, measuring the, uh, let's say, uh, less uh, conventional activities in the Black Sea area. Basically, the spoofing of uh, uh, GPS and the Galileo information with the immediate application to navigation to the protection of navigation. 
Other studies are uh, developed for uh, aerial navigation, utilizing uh, Galileo signals. Then a very interesting mission is uh, SAGA. SAGA is the Satellite Advanced Global Architecture, a secure and the cryptographic mission, it's called. And this is, and it will be the first European Space Agency mission for uh, uh, quantum communication, for quantum key distribution. It will be a fantastic satellite. And uh, we are part of this uh, project. There are six countries only uh, developing uh, Saga. Uh, some space missions which uh, involve, uh, let's say, planetary security. Uh, the first one is uh, Proba 3. I'm sure that uh, some of our colleagues in uh, JPL uh, heard about and uh, they're a bit jealous. I heard this is a coronagraph made of two spacecrafts at a distance of uh, around 140 meters, which are forming, uh, uh, it is a telescope devoted to uh, track and to detect and to track the possible uh, dangerous uh, asteroids or other bodies coming from the sun, from the direction of sun, uh, that we cannot observe from the Earth. And this, uh, this system will be very important. And um, one of our institutes in Bucharest is developing uh, the uh, distance maintaining uh, systems, which is a bit uh, complicated. Another mission is uh, Hera. Hera, as you are aware, in the Greek mythology, is uh, the, the partner of uh, Zeus, of the head of the Olympus. Hera is a common mission with uh, NASA, uh, with the asteroid impact mission. NASA is developing uh, the DART called mission. Basically, uh, the idea of those two missions is to uh, collide, to deflect the small component of a double asteroid called the Didymos, which uh, will be close to Earth in 2025-2026, and uh, uh, to manage for the first time a uh, uh, controlled deflection of a uh, potential dangerous body, which uh, will be part, uh, which might, hopefully not, might collide the Earth. And uh, Romania is country number four in this uh, mission. We are also uh, good in uh, space uh, traffic management. Uh, Romania is part of a consortium formed of uh, seven European Union countries, and they are uh, eight. They were eight because the UK is not in the European Union anymore. France, Germany, Spain, Italy, Poland, Portugal, because Portugal has the Azore Islands, and uh, there are some uh, telescopes there, and Romania. This is the consortium. And we have an uh, optical network, and uh, we are developing now, uh, uh, it is called the quasi-monostatic radar in the, the close to the ground station uh, Kea, something like 120 kilometers from Bucharest. It is a radar which might uh, track uh, centimeters at 1,000 kilometers distance. And uh, one of the uh, successes of this system is quite uh, new. Uh, something like two weeks ago, the European uh, Consortium for Space Traffic Management uh, uh, managed to, uh, to save 
one of the Galileo satellites. It was uh, the 23rd uh, Galileo uh, satellite that an orbit of uh, medium Earth orbit around uh, 20,000 kilometers, which was close to be collided by uh, the upper stage of an old Ariane 4 rocket since 1989, uh, which was a remnant from uh, uh, geo-orbit uh, transfer, geo-transfer orbit. And uh, due to the 43% of the information was furnished by the Romanian uh, systems. And due to this information, the satellite has been uh, moved from the orbit and uh, saved, okay? And uh, today it's functional again. It was an intrigue, uh, the most interesting, interesting Uh, you see in Romania, the 1st of March is a day devoted for ladies and uh, most of the, uh, the, the director of the uh, uh, office for space traffic management in Rosa and uh, the heads of projects and uh, some other seven persons, they were ladies and it was a nice, uh, it was an interesting moment. So uh, we concentrated our strategy. I will not speak about our uh, institutes, which are many about uh, industry, about we have uh, something like, uh, let's say 70 to 80 active organizations in Romania. Uh, we concentrated on some centers of competences, uh, competence which are niches in the European uh, Space Agency and in EU. And I can show you some, some of them. Most of those centers of competence are built with a large university or an institute, which confer the basic, the competence for everything, but they are developing just one niche. And I can show, for example, the Leopard is utilizing uh, uh, very powerful laser, it's a one petawatt laser, uh, to uh, generate the radiation environment as the one close to Jupiter. The CO space tech is uh, specialized in uh, big data and uh, actually in quantum communication. It is built within the Polytechnical University in Bucharest. The CARES Center is uh, uh, atmospheric LIDAR utilized to accept the measurements for, uh, let's say, for climate variables, utilized to calibrate satellites. The Starwalker is a center for human space flight with some very specific actions and uh, devices. Then uh, the context said this is a new center which is devoted to space robotics. We are starting to involve in uh, this uh, area. INCAS is the former Institute for Aviation, INCREST, the main developer of uh, Romanian satellite. It is a center concentrated on uh, geographic niche on the Black Sea, Black Sea uh, application, space applications uh, near the Black Sea. Then uh, this is a new center in which start, the development started two decades ago. Uh, it is the, we called it the satellite uh, plant. The, it, is, uh, it started with nanosatellites. Now it is a huge, uh, huge compared, for, uh, compared with the nanosatellites, a huge uh, uh, testing and integration center having all the facilities uh, for satellites up to 50 kilograms. And uh, probably uh, those people will uh, make money from this center in the next future. Then another niche is the intra-satellite wireless technology. 
So the uh, harnessing in uh, large uh, satellites are replaced by some kind of a wireless systems. It's uh, quite, uh, it seems very easy, but it's not easy. And uh, this system is uh, working now for the first uh, software defined uh, satellites, which are developed by both uh, Thales and uh, Airbus, the Nova set A and Nova set B. Then another center is developed for uh, small launchers and space vehicles in uh, Incas, where uh, uh, there is a complex of uh, development and uh, high speed testing and uh, some others. This is the distribution, the actual distribution of uh, the space activities of major space activities in Romania, we can see we have uh, almost in any region some university or industry or a facility devoted to space. Now uh, you can see uh, we have a specific uh, view on space. Uh, we consider space uh, systems as critical infrastructure for Earth. Uh, we like space, space exploration, but in the same time, uh, uh, we are thinking that uh, space is moving from uh, kilograms, we say, to kilobytes. So we are living uh, today a change uh, of uh, view. Uh, we're going towards uh, information and uh, probably we will uh, move our thinking from many, many things to be moved to other uh, celestial bodies to, uh, let's say, to, uh, towards uh, information. This, this might mean in situ resources utilization. This might mean uh, think of our ways to communicate than the standard ones. And this is space. So uh, nice things will be always uh, the same. And uh, in our might, I will thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Piso. Uh, we are uh, really glad to having you here uh, and uh, uh, getting this uh, it's valuable, my pleasure. Valuable, valuable information about about what uh, the Romanian uh, agency, space agency doing. Uh, I'm, I'm really happy to see in how many international programs, national and international program, programs, yes, uh, the Romanian space agency. Give only a few examples. Yes, yes, uh, and uh, and I, I I was thinking that Romania is honoring its its tradition, and let's not forget that the uh, jet propulsion engine has was invented by a Romanian, and uh, now the entire uh, space industry uh, is and business is based on jet propulsion, even if uh, of course the technologies developed very much. Uh, uh, now, um, because everybody uh, talks about the universe and the uh, sky, the space. And uh, uh, about about regulating it and uh, monetizing it, of course that uh, we cannot do that without having uh, it that we need. And I think that uh, uh, makes the link uh, to uh, Dr. Virgila Dumitrae. Uh, I, I I only hope that uh, Dr. Dumitrae is still fine with us. Uh, I am. And to. Invite him to take to take the uh, um, things a brief description of of it. Your doctor Ad, uh, uh, He is a data scientist at NASA laboratory in Pasadena, California, here uh, near Los Angeles. Where at present time he develops outer planetary environment models and radiation monitoring tools for the Juno mission, validation tools for future Europa Clippers reason instrument observation plans and performs atmospheric composition retrievals for Jupiter, Saturn, and Uranus. He received his PhD degree in mechanical engineering from the University of in, at Buffalo in 1997 for research completing simulation and modeling of high-speed turbulent reacting flows. 
prior to joining the gel propulsion laboratory as a senior member of uh, technical staff in 2004 and University of Southern California as adjunct lecturer in 2006, Dr. Dimitrae served for six years as a senior engineer at the CFD Research Corporation in Huntsville, Alabama. At JPL, his work is optimization methods and uncertainty analysis applied to decision problems, supported tasks from the JPL Strategic Technologies Program Office. And he was part of the Sounder PEATE software development team in the Suomi NPP projects. During his career, Dr. Dumitrae has delivered solutions in turbulent combustion modeling, data dimension reduction, neural network, paneling pathways, experimental robotics, and scientific software frameworks. He has published papers and technical reports on advanced modeling of compressible flows direct numerical simulations and large eddy simulations, LES, of chemically magnetohydrodynamics decision support for technology portfolio investment and outer planetary atmospheric and magnetospheric I must confess that uh, it has been a challenge to see Dr. Dr. Atumitrae. Uh, uh, it's hard for us to read what he, what he has been doing until now. Dr. Atumitrae, we are so to have you with us today. The floor is yours. Thank you. Dr. Virgil Atumitrae is going to, to, to present uh, some thoughts, some ideas about space discoveries via remote sensing. And at the end of it, I have a question for him especially. Thank you. All right. Uh, good morning. Good evening. Uh, and thank you for your kind participation in this uh, online conference. I'd like to thank uh, Council General Cosmin Dumitrescu for uh, organizing this event. And I must add, I'm grateful for the privilege to be present as a speaker in such illustrious company. Uh, the main points of this. Uh, what NASA missions are. Uh, using or have used um, remote also of this method of observation from a few uh, NASA missions and a few uh, conclusion ideas. Uh, by the way, this uh, the picture you're seeing in this slide is a false color view from NASA's Cassini spacecraft uh, showing clouds in Saturn's northern hemisphere. Uh, it uses a combination of spectral filters uh, to infrared light. So, um, not surprisingly, remote sensing is another about natural uh, sonars. Uh, most bats produce uh, high pitch uh, calls to echolocate. Um, the sounds and their echoes help the animals uh, navigate or uh, secure a meal. And there is also a first known human sonar. Uh, Daniel Kish, uh, who lost his sight to retinal cancer when he was uh, 13 months old and uses uh, his body uh, for echolocating to ride his bike using uh, tongue clicks. And then uh, this is a reconstructed image of how dolphins see humans with echolocation. And uh, the modern technology now, uh, <clears throat> high tech, um, you see an example of a 3D LiDAR scan on the Interstate 510 bridge in New Orleans, Louisiana. The U.S. Geological Survey used this uh, technique in parts to map flooding after the 2012 Hurricane Isaac. So, finally, remote sensing is the acquisition of information about the target in the absence of uh, physical contact. Um, and we measure changes in electromagnetic fields through uh, spectroscopy, um, changes in acoustic fields with sonars, and uh, potential fields with uh, gravitational sensors. Uh, spectroscopic remote sensing is one of the most powerful techniques for determining the surface composition of 
inaccessible targets, and compositional information is important for constraining the history of a target. So, as I already hinted, uh, there are two approaches to remote sensing. Uh, passive remote sensing, which uses natural sources of radiation uh, via attenuation, reflection, scattering, or emission, and then uh, that uh, signal is analyzed. Uh, we use solar light, lunar light, uh, stellar light, uh, thermal emissions from uh, planetary bodies, and more recently, we are able to capture gravitational radiation. Um, as far as the active remote sensing, uh, we use artificial sources of radiation, uh, which is a reflector or scattered, and the signal is then uh, uh, analyzed. Now, um, uh, we have, uh, as we mentioned, uh, sonars, which uh, are acronyms for sound navigation ranging. Uh, we can use uh, radio waves um, as uh, radars, laser light in uh, LIDARs, uh, which is light detection and ranging and even white light uh, through long path uh, DOAs, uh, differential optical absorption uh, spectroscopy. And um, I have examples, uh, as I said, uh, passive uh, remote sensing uh, human eye cameras, radiometers, and uh, the active uh, remotes that were already mentioned. So um, the primary radiation source um, <clears throat> in our environment um, is our sun. Our eyes have evolved to be sensitive to the visible range, which is the most uh, intense uh, bandwidth uh, or radiation uh, by our star. The electromagnetic uh, spectrum refers to the full range of uh, frequencies <clears throat> and also the characteristic distribution of EM radiation emitted or absorbed by that particular object and devices that um, used to measure electromagnetic spectrum are called spectrograph or spectrometer. And uh, different, uh, in different bandwidths, uh, we can collect uh, different uh, information. Uh, we mostly use uh, ultraviolet, uh, visible, uh, infrared, and microwave uh, regimes uh, that contain um, uh, specific information uh, from uh, the uh, radiation source and the matter that uh, it's uh, <clears throat> encountered. Now, um, it's not limited to that. Uh, we are also using uh, X-ray uh, and even gamma ray uh, information that is available uh, in space. So, um, as as you know, energy and matter are intertwined. Uh, so, there's no surprise that uh, radiation carries uh, substance information about the emitting source and the matter that has uh, interacted uh, within its path. The information is uh, specific and unique, ideally, although some environmental parameters such as pressure can affect it. And um, as you can see, uh, we have uh, these effects, uh, uh, reflection, uh, absorption, uh, scattering, transmission, uh, and then subsequent uh, emission. A sensor will capture this uh, modified signal, and the sensor needs to be properly uh, calibrated in order to yield accurate measurements. And uh, these measurements can be of two types, uh, broadband or frequ frequency selective. Uh, broadband, broadband probes uh, uh, sense uh, any signal across a wide range of frequencies and is usually made of uh, independent uh, detectors. Um, the frequency selective measurements, the measurement system consists of a field antenna and a frequency selective receiver or a spectrum analyzing allowing, <clears throat> uh, uh, allowing to monitor the frequency range of interest. Um, now, as an essential part of the remote sensing process is data analysis. Uh, which in order to succeed uh, requires uh, a priori data and a well-rounded physical model that is a representation of the phenomenon that we observe. This leads generally to an iterative approach uh, to obtain the final result. And then uh, validation is always the last step, but not always possible concurrently with the timing of the measurements 
or even uh, asynchronous, especially for non-terrestrial instruments. So, which NASA mission can uh, remote uh, carry remote sensing instruments? Well, uh, all of them <laughs> uh, be either a camera, a radiometer, a spectrometer, radar. Um, all these, uh, all these spacecraft that um, you see in this chart, uh, looking at uh, Earth, Moon, Mars, uh, the gas giants, uh, the heliosphere, uh, and the Sun, and the astrophysics uh, missions, they all rely on remote sensing. As far as the uh, Earth observing uh, satellite fleet, the array of instruments uh, is mind-boggling. From from uh, measuring uh, carbon dioxide uh, in OCO2 mission uh, and ozone concentration in the former uh, SAGE mission uh, to soil moisture, uh, SMAP uh, mission, uh, vegetation index. There are two uh, MODIS instruments, one Terra and Aqua, uh, to gravitational field measurements to track uh, Earth's water movement. So, uh, uh, water on Earth creates gravitational disturbance that is picked up by the satellite, and you figure out what um, what happened. And finally, um, the astrophysics missions uh, encompass a broad range of topics, uh, from the birth of the universe and its evolution and composition, to the processes leading to the development of planets, and stars and galaxy to the physical conditions of matter in extreme gravitational fields and to the search for life on uh, exoplanets orbiting other stars. So, um, now I'll give you a, a few of, uh, uh, examples or results from um, uh, NASA missions. One of the most astounding results comes from the uh, Wilkinson microwave uh, anisotropy probe uh, this mission was launched in 2001 and completed in 2010. This uh, detailed old sky picture of uh, the infant universe was created from nine years of WMAP data. Uh, the image reveals 13.77 billion year old temperature fluctuations shown as color differences that correspond to uh, the seeds that grew to become the galaxy. Uh, this image shows a temperature range of plus minus 200 microkelvin. And uh, this, this mission revealed the conditions as they existed in the early uh, universe by measuring properties of the cosmic bi microwave background radiation over the full sky. This radiation was released approximately 370,000 uh, years after the birth of the universe. This uh, shows us the content uh, and the fundamental structure of the universe. Um, another uh, outstanding um, discovery was made by uh, NASA's uh, Spitzer Space Telescope that has captured in 2005, the, for the first time, enough light from an exoplanet to identify signatures of molecules in their atmosphere. This is a planet that uh, uh, <clears throat> belongs to a star in the constellation Pegasus, uh, some 159 light years away from us. Uh, this is the first planet detected through, through more than one method, uh, the first exo, uh, extrasolar planet known to have an atmosphere, and many other firsts, but uh, looking at this uh, uh, infrared, spectrum, infrared spectrum above, uh, astronomers were shocked because it doesn't look anything like uh, theorists had predicted. Uh, for example, um, there should have been some water in the 8 to 9 uh, micron uh, bandwidth, uh, but there was none. And then um, we uh, uh, also see here uh, silicate dust um, that uh, is basically tiny grains of sand. Uh, this suggests that the planet's skies uh, could be filled with high clouds of dust, unlike anything seen in our own solar system, and that could explain why the water is not visible uh, either. And a more recent result uh, comes from uh, the Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite test that is supposed to survey 200,000 uh, of the brightest star near the sun to search for uh, exoplanets. Uh, you 
using high precision brightness, uh, in, uh, brightness measurements from this telescope, astronomers found that uh, uh, nearby brown dwarf uh, Luman 16b, uh, its atmosphere is dominated by high speed global winds akin to Earth's, uh, Earth's uh, jet stream system. Um, the go this global circulation determines how clouds are distributed in uh, the atmosphere, giving a striped appearance. And uh, this looks uh, fairly close to uh, Jupiter, uh, as well as uh, the polar regions, which are uh, dominated by vortices. So this is a, a hot uh, Jupiter, uh, but it's not a planet and it's not a star either. Now, uh, um, the points that our previous uh, speakers made about uh, mining uh, moon and ice stars, uh, how do we find um, the surface compositions uh, of planets and uh, asteroids in the absence of samples or uh, in situ measure measurements? We basically use uh, remote sensing, um, but these are restricted to a very thin layer of the uh, uh, of these uh, celestial uh, objects. Uh, we have uh, several approaches. Uh, spectral, usually infrared reflectance absorption measurements. This gives constraints on likely mineralogies. Uh, we use that for Mercury, Europa. Uh, neutron emissions, uh, these are good for uh, forming or uh, sensing uh, subsurface ice. We use that in Mars on, and the Moon. And most useful are the uh, gamma rays um, <clears throat> because um, they give uh, elemental abundance. Uh, the energies of the individual gamma rays are characteristic of particular elements. Now, uh, the uh, grand instrument on Dawn sp uh, spacecraft is a gamma ray and neutron detector uh, spectrometer and was designed to measure elemental abundances on the surfaces of asteroids, and they did that for Vesta and uh, Ceres. Uh, now, uh, one of my favorite uh, missions uh, is uh, a Juno. Uh, it's a polar orbiter with nine instruments that uh, revolves um, every 53 days uh, around the planet. Uh, the mission is to measure uh, the planet's composition, gravitational field, magnetic field, and polar magnetosphere. Uh, one of the instruments is the microwave radiometer. It has uh, six uh, channels uh, fed by six antennas mounted uh, on the side of the spacecraft. The radiometers uh, are uh, distributed in wavelength uh, from uh, one centimeter to 50 centimeter, which allows to uh, reach uh, very uh, deep uh, inside the uh, atmosphere. And the orbit uh, is threaded inside, sorry, uh, inside the radiation belt um, so that uh, the atmosphere and the uh, um, radiation belts are, are seen uh, separately. And as the, uh, as the uh, spacecraft uh, moves along its orbit, each point on, on its track is uh, observed many times at many uh, uh, different emission angles, which helps with, uh, with the model uh, for uh, this observation. So, um, uh, why are we interested in uh, in these uh, uh, properties, um, especially the atmospheric composition? Well, um, the elemental composition of uh, well-mixed regions below the cloud layers in the atmospheres of the giant planets uh, play a critical role in understanding the formation evolu and evolution of the solar system. There are basically two competing uh, scenarios uh, for the gas giant formation. Um, uh, first is the uh, nucleated instability or core accretion, uh, which uh, <clears throat> would mean that the composition of uh, Jupiter, for example, will be similar to the Sun. Or um, there are um, disk instabilities where um, uh, clumps of gas collapse uh, in the circumstellar disk. And that will lead to a different composition from uh, the sun abundance. And heavy element abundance is available 
for the gas uh, giants with the exception of uh, oxygen which gets absorbed or combined with hydrogen to form water uh, and um, the point uh, of these missions is to determine the oxygen abundance abundance in the atmosphere now um, as we uh, uh, look at uh, jupiter we also see uh, the great red spot which is a persistent high pressure region uh, in the atmosphere of Jupiter producing an anticyclonic storm that is the largest in the solar system. Uh, in fact, Earth could easily fit in it, could be swallowed. And uh, Juno mission uh, found that uh, this um, uh, motion, this atmospheric motion, this uh, anticyclonic storm uh, goes very deep uh, down to 100 bars, which puts also into question the hypothesis of, well, mixed uh, assumption, uh, which was um, employed to uh, make different atmospheric models. So uh, um, if water is present in the atmosphere, it is ex expected that it will form uh, uh, from it will form the deepest clouds, while the presence of ammonia would generate under certain abundance conditions, uh, water ammonia solution cloud which uh, const constitutes a, a source of microwave uh, op opacity, which uh, affects uh, the measurements. And uh, here you see a, a plot of uh, 3D image in the infrared of the Jupiter North Pole. You see these uh, uh, vertical motions, which are specific uh, to Jupiter. And um, also uh, you see um, a sample of the microwave um, uh, measurements at two different frequency uh, associated with uh, infrared observation from uh, Gemini and the Hubble uh, Space Telescope uh, in the visible regime showing that uh, the cloud motions um, or the weather, if you uh, want to take it, uh, goes well below the water clouds. Uh, this low frequency um, is uh, essentially probing depths of uh, uh, tens uh, of bars up to 100 bars. And uh, a model that is used to interpret the data collected by um, uh, the microwave radiometer looks uh, like this, where there's a sequence of clouds um, obscuring the microwave uh, radiation. And finally, uh, something that uh, is coming um, <clears throat> Uh, in the near future, uh, Europa Clipper um, is a orbiter with nine instruments. It will go uh, in space uh, in 2024, and it will uh, study the Galilean, Gal Galilean moon Europa through a series of flybys while in orbit around uh, Jupiter. And uh, the goals of uh, Clipper is to explore its habit habitability and the air aid in the selection of a landing site for future uh, Europa lander. And um, uh, this will uh, determine the uh, <clears throat> liquid water chemistry and energy for, for this uh, moon um, and um, specifically to uh, study the ice shell and the uh, ocean. And uh, one of the instruments is, uh, is the radar uh, instrument, uh, reason, is um, an acronym for radar for Europa assessment and sounding ocean to near surface. And, uh, Dr. Piso mentioned Jews, uh, they have RIME, uh, a similar radar, so RIME and Reason. Um, it's uh, 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 an interagency joke, I guess. Uh, but uh, this radar will um, is a multi frequency, multi channel uh, ice penetrating uh, system that. Um, will investigate uh, the ice shell uh, surface character and the subsurface uh, structure. And this instrument makes innovative use of radar sounding, altimetry, reflectom reflectometry, and plasma and particle analysis. So um, in and final, uh, essentially remote sensing is um, uh, a method that relies on uh, measuring uh, radiation emitted, scattered, or reflected by atmosphere and surfaces. Uh, it involves a large number of uh, parameters and requires a, uh, a, um, a very complicated physical model. 
uh, as uh, you saw, these are indirect measurements and uh, need uh, thorough and continuous validation, but uh, with improvements in technology and uh, data algorithms, uh, the satellite measurements will be more and more uh, useful. And uh, this would be always um, one of the man many data sources needed to understand the solar and galactic systems. Uh, thank you for your attention and I hope uh, you heard something. Yes, Dr. Adumitrai, we heard uh, everything after the moment when you restarted uh, the transmission. Um, I think that I think that it's absolutely fascinating uh, uh, this part of of the exploration that uh, uh, remote sensing is, is doing is is really, really unknown to the broad public. I'm sure that uh, people that are um, attending this conference uh, have a very good knowledge of that. But uh, uh, the general population, as uh, we call it now in a pandemic COVID-19 uh, uh, social environment, have no idea about that. We are uh, right now uh, after probably almost four hours of, of a marathon with uh, several, with six absolutely fascinating uh, presentations. Um, delivered by uh, six uh, uh, scientists uh, unparalleled, I, I, I could say. And uh, uh, that tells me that um, there is no better way to start the series of the, of the conferences that the Council of General of Romania wants to, uh, to use for, for celebrating the, the 10th anniversary of the signing of the joint declaration on the implementation of the strategic partnership for the 21st century between Romania and the United States of America then with uh, such a conference with such scientists that show how well uh, Romania and the United States cooperate in consolidating and developing this academic dimension of the strategic partnership. Uh, you are working for building a future uh, for the entire uh, uh, earth, not only for our two nations, and I'm very proud to see that uh, I'm very proud to see that uh, 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 Romania is an active actor and uh, uh, an important contributor for the progress in space science, is engineering and of course security. So uh, uh, thank you very much for. You know, now I propose you to pass to the next segment for meeting now and uh, to take uh, several questions from uh, from uh, people that uh, that assisted that uh, took these presentations and uh, uh, i propose you to use both uh, working uh, languages so uh, we can use both romanian and english both in, in asking the questions and answering the questions uh, if you agree if you all agree to to that kind of of, uh, of procedure so uh, uh, the stage is open for uh, questions. I've seen in the attendance of, of other uh, amazing specialists in this in this field. So uh, I know several of them as uh, uh, they used to work for SpaceX or for other uh, companies, and also uh, some uh, specialists from Romania, from the Romanian Space Agency, from the technical section of the Romanian Academy, and from universities. So uh, please. Uh, yeah, the stage is open uh, for for questions, both in Romanian and in, in in English. Thank you very much for your for your presentations. I'm I'm really astonished. Thank you. In ce măsură considerați că această guană după resurse în spațiu va afecta securitatea pe pământ? Și dacă, și dacă această goană este de natură să conducă în principal la progres sau poate să imprime apariția unor riscuri cu care națiunile de pe pământ nu s-au confruntat înainte. Pot eu să dau un prim răspuns aici. Problema este dacă avem nevoie de resurse. Asta este una din primele și dacă, știu, dacă primim un bilion de tone din ceva, ce facem cu acel ceva, cu aur, nu-l mai vindem. 
sau cu metale rare. Câteodată trebuie să estimezi dacă nu este mai simplu să încheie un acord comercial între Europa, Statele Unite și China, ca să utilizezi pământuri rare, decât să trimiți, știu eu, să capturezi un asteroid. Sau trebuie să faci o estimare economică foarte serioasă dacă într-adevăr ai nevoie de Heliu 3 de pe lună. Subiectul este discutat de mulți ani și este important, dar nu e sigur că vom avea nevoie de reactoare de fuziune pentru a produce energie pe pământ. Poate ne trebuie în spațiu pentru alte scopuri. Așa că aceste întrebări sunt puțin, trebuie să facem distinția între să scoatem din el tot ce se poate și să-l vindem, cum e, asta e o extremă, și a păstra universul pentru explorare deocamdată și a-l pregăti pe termen mai lung pentru expansiune. Cam astea ar fi opțiunile. Și, mă rog, opțiunea intermediară care poate fi cea naturală în evoluție. Este o dezbatere foarte serioasă care Până la urmă, aceste probleme se duc în Comitetul ONU, pe care am, hai să spunem, onoarea, dar în același timp, enorma dificultate să-l conduc aproape online. Și problemele de curățenie a spațiului, adică long-term sustainability of outer space, problemele de utilizare a resurselor, Astea sunt, astea sunt foarte serioase, sunt, trebuie adaptate instrumentele juridice, Spațiale, este o competiție serioasă și peste toate acestea intervine problema, să-i spunem, militară și de securitate, care până la urmă primează. Așa că ideea de resurse, eu aș considera-o și în termenii, hai să spunem, un village, nu neapărat mult village association, ci cum să facem un, o bază științifică pe lună, să utilizăm resursele de pe alte corpuri cerești ca să putem să dezvoltăm acolo ceva, să dezvoltăm, știu eu, spații care să adăpostească oameni, să dezvoltăm aparatură științifică, să dezvoltăm o tehnologie care să ne poată să facă, să, să poată să ne facă să mergem mai departe. Cam asta văd eu în următorii 10-20 de ani. Mulțumesc. Dacă aș dori să, să avem o, o opinie și de la domnul Marcu, cel care, domnul doctor Marcu, care a, a, ne-a prezentat cu o prezentare foarte bună despre cum urmează să fie valorificată economic cercetarea spațială. Dacă dumneavoastră puteți să ne spuneți, domnule doctor, pe care parte o considerați dumneavoastră că ar trebui să ne axăm pe cea a explorării științifice, a monetizării, a transformării într-o activitate profitabilă de natură să aducă bunăstare pe um, Da. Well, tot, credeți că natura umană s-a schimbat în ultima sută de ani sau în ultimii 30 de ani? Dacă istoria e să fie un exemplu, va fi, cum zic englezii, un mixed bag. În primul rând, când, când, când și nu dacă vom avea primul sac de aur adus în spațiu, Veți vedea că în fiecare garaj din lumea asta o să încearcă oamenii să vadă cum poate să facă o rachetă. Chiar cu ignoranța mulțimii care o să înveți atunci ce greu e să ajungi în spațiu. Dar atracția către, către uh, resurse este în firea omului. Uh, ține de ceilalți, de oamenii cu autoritate și de autorități în general să stabilească un framework pentru chestia asta. Și e ca în medicină mai bine previi decât să combați. Deci asta așteptăm și aici sunt 
organizațiile de pe care le pomenește domnul Pizo și Eduardo acolo este importanța înțelepților planeții, de planetei, dacă vreți, să anticipeze înainte ca firea umană să-și dea drumul neînfrânat în spațiu. Pentru că, repet, dacă vine primul sac de aur din spațiu cu câteva miliarde pentru partidul, partida care a organizat aducerea și nu este un framework clar în care să prevenim conflicte și știu ce alte fel de crize, crizele se vor întâmpla. Domnule doctor Stoica, dumneavoastră, ce opinați? Sunt mai mult de opinia lui Bogdan, dar cred că contextul care m-aș referi la flărgii de la resurse, pur și simplu atracția către profit. Deci există un interes către profit de la cei care vor să simple particulare și asta e mână, indiferent că va fi, știu eu, Helium Free sau Tourism sau, știu eu, să, pur și simplu să, să dea servicii la guvern profitabile pentru de deplasări și așa mai departe. Principalul, cred că, și principala motivație în clipa de față să rămâne una strategică, ce obțin pentru lume. Deci e legată de, știu eu, cine ocupă primul, să spunem așa, zonele mai importante și, cum să spun, măsură ce vor uh, apărea interese private, se va extinde același concept care este în clipa de față în care națiunea, uh, o anumită națiune, hai să spunem America, încearcă să-și protezeze uh, 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 comercianții din națiunea respectivă. Deci apare, va apare la un moment dat un conflict, fiindcă ați întrebat chestia asta, cât de mult duce progresul la, știu eu, sau la, la conflict. Deci uh, este inevitabil să, să fie știu eu, competiție și, mă rog, conflicte care sper că nu vor duce la lucruri prea violente și se vor putea rezolva prin negocieri, dar există un interes de a, cum să spun, a domina spațiul, indiferent că economic, strategic și așa mai departe, deci există o competiție în continuare între țări și spațiul oferă ceva strategic, deci competiția se va Domnul Adumitroi? Eu sunt mai puțin mânat de profit și mai mult de cunoaștere. E paralel între Star Wars și Star Trek. Eu sunt mai mult pe Star Trek. Înțeleg. Nu era o chestie la mine de unde sunt, ci de cum cred eu că este natura umană și unde suntem în clipa de față. Eu sunt evident că cercetător, sunt înmânat mai mult de lucrurile științifice, dar per global nu este descoperirea în sine care a dus la știu eu răspândirea și cu curentul electric sau așa mai departe. Sunt corporațiile care sunt înmânate până la urmă de probleme. Bun, să nu uităm că încă o istoria se repetă și aș fi vrut să îl întreb pe domnul, domnul doctor Prunariu și să facă și legătură la dacă binevoiește cu următoarea temă pe care o propun discuției. În acest context, profit versus science și toate cu efect asupra securității globale, în voastră, domnule Prunariu, ce credeți că este mai important? continuarea cu același rind sau în același rind foarte accelerată a explorării, atât că este motivată de profit, în special în sectorul privat, sau încercarea de reglementare mai strictă, mai precisă a dreptului spațiului și cine ar trebui să o facă? Ce foruri vedeți dumneavoastră potrivit? Adică că sunteți membru în o parte dintre ele. Aceste probleme merg paralel. Depinde care o ia înaintea cui. Și în mod sigur reglementarea va rămâne în urma activităților care se vor dovedi profitabile. Sectorul privat, știți-vă că 
cei care vorbesc rachete, care au programe spațiale deosebite, care au ajuns pe stația cosmică internațională, sunt primii 2 miliarde ai lumii. Nu? Jeff Bezos și Elon Musk. Deci oamenii ca ei și mai sunt și alții care sunt foarte potenți, vor fi mânați de dorința de a obține mai ieftin și mai multe materii prime din spațiul cosmic, dacă se poate, fie că este de pe lună, de pe asteroizi. S-au făcut studii, s-au pornit companii. Luxemburgul, de exemplu, a dat o lege specială care favorizează, din punct de vedere financiar, toate companiile care se ocupă de explorarea altor corpuri cerești, în principal asteroizi și exploatarea lor. Și multe firme s-au format acolo, unele și-au mutat filiale în Luxemburg, mai pentru că acordă facilități. Acolo ne aflăm cu Fundația Asteroid, unde eu sunt vicepreședintele Consiliului de Administrație în perioada actuală. Desigur, reglementările trebuie să vină la un moment dat, dar reglementările la nivel global sunt date de Organizația Națiunilor Unite. Alte organizații pot emite anumite norme voluntare și ONU face în principal așa ceva, dar în general cele ale ONU sunt încet, încet însușite și respectate de statele membre, iar la un moment dat o parte din aceste norme pot să devină acorduri internaționale, să devină legi. Dar e foarte greu de negociat în perioada de față o reglementare bine definită la nivelul Organizației Națiunilor Unite. Ceea ce se întâmplă acum sunt discuții. Tocmai s-a format un grup de lucru în cadrul ONU, Comitetului ONU pentru Explorarea Pașnică a Spațiului Extraatmosferic, e în subordinea subcomitetului juridic, pentru Space Resources. Deci partea de resurse spațiale este văzută deja ca o problemă care trebuie abordată, discutată și într-un fel reglementată prin intermediul Organizației Națiunilor Unite. Pe lângă aceasta, eu sunt și expert în cadrul Moon Village Association, pentru că tot discutase puțin domnul Adrian Stoica, pomenise de această problemă, iar această asociație și-a format de foarte puțin timp un Global Working Group on Sustainable Lunar Activities, un grup global de lucru pentru activități lunare sustenabile unde problemele care sunt abordate sunt mult mai diverse, nu numai resursele. Iar aici sunt 37 de membri în acest grup, de pe cele cinci continente. Am fost ales președintele acestui grup și chiar astăzi, înainte de această conferință, am avut a doua ședință a grupului de lucru. Lunar avem ședință timp de doi ani de zile. Ceea ce vom dezbate și concluziile pe care le vom trage acolo, vor fi prezentate ca un suport pentru discuții mai aprofundate în cadrul Comitetului ONU pentru Explorarea Pașnică a Spațiului Extraatmosferic. Practic vom accelera într-un fel abordarea acestor probleme prin soluțiile deja discutate de o serie întreagă de specialiști, reprezentând atâtea state membre ale ONU. Deși în cadrul Deși... acestui grup de lucru suntem reprezentați ca persoane individuale, specialiști, nu reprezentanți ai statelor dar influența va fi majoră asupra deciziilor pe care le va lua ONU. Dar, în mod sigur, privații care vor avea posibilități vor începe să exploreze și să exploateze resurse din spațiul cosmic, de pe asteroid sau de pe lucru în momentul de față, iar reglementările vor ajunge într-un fel din urmă. Este greu să elaborezi întâi reglementări și după aceea să vezi care sunt toate subtilitățile problemei practice prin care se rezolvă acestea. Asta este opinia mea. Mulțumim, mulțumim foarte mult pentru... Da, este foarte precis și sigur foarte documentat. Și mă bucur să, să remar faptul că în România este foarte bine reprezentată în aceste comitete internaționale și uh, cu siguranță că uh, ele vor veni cu soluții. Sperăm cât mai repede după momentul în care se va debarca pe mai știu ce asteroi sau ce alte planete pentru evitarea conflictelor. Iar pentru că tot vorbim despre resurse, am abordat de cel mai multe ori în 
resurse energie pentru industria tech, surale, străi, ori mai știu eu, metale prețioase. Ne-a scăpat, fie că a fost vorba de apă, ce este drept. Pe lângă apă, esențial pentru viață este și pana. Și pentru că avem alături de noi încă, acum alături de noi, din România, un probabil cel mai, sau cu siguranță, cel mai bun specialist al nostru specialist de pe profesorul Bogdan Bazgă și, și, și reprezentantul nostru la, la FAO la, și la OSC, nu, OCDM, ce scuze, l-aș ruga să intervină, n-aș dori să pun eu întrebări despre securitatea alimentară, dar atâta vreme cât dumneavoastră portiți. Seara, mulțumesc! Știu că este târziu pentru noi, o ora târzie, dar mă bucur și putea să fie și până la 3 dimineața. Este o conferință deosebită de interesantă și cu atâtea somită, spune. Aș avea o întrebare, dacă se poate. Eu știu că urmează și în șirul dumneavoastră de conferințe să abordați această temă a securității alimentare. Dar pentru invitații speciale, pentru experții, aș fi avut o simplă întrebare. În cazul acestei goane, să spunem, după resurse, a... Care consideră deci că ar fi cea mai căutată? Eu, din ce te știu, este chiar apa. În afară de minerale, de metale prețiate. Pentru că în momentul în care am s-a găsit apă, este primul pas către posibilitatea de a viețui. Asta pe de-o parte, pe de altă parte, toți poate știm și realizăm, este o, un alt plan, în sensul că la nivelul nostru, să zicem așa, al terei, ne chinuim să explicăm că trebuie să ne oprim din această goană după resurse și să folosim resursele regenerabile și în special cele solare, uniene, decât să intrăm în, în adâncul terei. Pe de altă parte, este această goană după resurse în spate. Nu trebuie să concluzioane din cei șase experți pentru care și le mulțumesc pentru Care ar fi cea mai importantă resursă oficial și neoficial căutată în momentul de față? Și dacă este apa, Mulțumesc! Adrian. Domnul Soica. Ok. Deci, cred că depinde și de unde căutăm. Deci, evident, există Europa, Oceans, există deci, locuri îndepărtate. Știm foarte clar că există oceane mari cu apă. Nu cred că s-a pus foarte mult problema ca noi să ne ducem neapărat pe Europa să zicem, din condiții, știu eu, de radiație și așa mai departe. Chestia asta cu resursele este, cum să spun, este una din motivații, cum s-a mai discutat mai înainte, nu este unica motivație și este foarte interesantă, deci, din punctul de vedere a profitului, evident, unii sunt mânați de chestia asta, problema de plecare de pe pământ și, știu eu, sau de extindere de pe pământ și utilizarea resurselor în altă parte este, are și alte motivații care au fost prezentate mai înainte, știu eu, un caz de accident, știu eu, ceva care să afecteze, știu eu, populația terei și așa mai departe. Deci, dacă ne uităm până la nivelul, hai să până la Marte, probabil că apa este resursa cea mai interesantă de obținut. E greu de văzut în tripa de față, cu excepția unor știu eu, stații spațiale, deci nave spațiale care, știu, vor duce omenirea, a văzut chiar conceptul în asta de la nivel de, știu eu, mini-planetă, să zic așa, care a călătorit prin spațiu, deci, dar la, dacă ne uităm la planetele actuale, 
în clipa de față, e greu de gândit că vom merge dincolo de Marte pentru uh, a stabili, știu eu, uh, locuire cu, cu oameni, atât din lipsă de, știu eu, de energie și de radiație și mai multe probleme complexe cu actuale cunoștințe care le avem în clipa de față. În, în timp, e greu de prezis. Da. Activați microfonul, domnul Cunariu. În problema aceasta a resurselor aș împărți o în două părți distincte. Sunt resurse de care ai nevoie ca să supraviețuiești pe o altă planetă și acolo indiscutabil oxigenul, apa sunt resursele cele mai importante și sunt resurse pe care, care sunt rare pe pământ, le poți găsi mai ușor în, pe alte corpuri cerești pe care le aduci pentru, a, uh, pentru profit. În primul rând că sunt necesare, sunt pământuri rare care pe pământ se exploatează foarte greu sapi mii de tone de pământ ca să găsești câteva grame dintr-un anumit material, iar undeva pe asteroi se pot găsi în, în formă pură, în anumite cantități mai mari sau într-o formă mult mai concentrată decât pe pământ, iar zborul până la asteroi și aducerea lor s-ar putea să fie mai eficiente decât exploatarea pe pământ. După aceea, uitați de exemplu, pe lună se găsește într-o cantitate mult mai mare decât pe pământ heliu 3. Heliu 3, care este un material strategic și sunt convins că competiția mare se va da practic între americani și chinezi care vor obține acest material, în ce cantități, pentru a-l putea utiliza ulterior. Desigur, e și greu de depozitat acest Heliu 3, dar asta e altă problemă. Poate se va folosi chiar acolo, pe lună. Foarte interesant opinia noastră, domnule Prunariu, legat de competitorii principali pentru resursa respectivă de pe lună. Și în același context vă adresez tuturor o întrebare mai provocatoare. Considerați că această goană după resurse, această competiție economică pentru profit și pentru influență, va conduce și la o militarizare nepotrivită sau poate potrivită a spațiului și cât este de potrivită sau de nepotrivită în opinia noastră? Aș, Dacă... aș răspunde un pic la întrebarea asta. Spune, ce început să tu să spui ceva? Băi... Nu, 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 spune tu, spune tu. Să stau pe 10 minute, ok. De... În primul rând, trebuie să ne gândim că pentru o perioadă cât o generație, noi am dezvoltat de la nimic, de la o bilă aruncată pe orbită în 1957, un sistem care funcționează acum, care ne oferă, care creează niște infrastructuri care sunt critice pentru planetă. Planeta nu mai poate funcționa cu fără sateliții de comunicație, de poziționare, de observare a terei. Știința nu mai poate funcționa fără pă, telescoapele spațiale, practic, adică depinde de spațiu în momentul ăsta. Și trebuie să, noi ăștia care am început să trăim de pe vremea aia, pă, trebuie să pă, înțelegem că vine o generație nouă. Adică, noi până acum discutăm despre bani, discutăm despre putere, nu știm ce înseamnă putere. Discutăm despre concepte care acum se schimbă. Adică spațiul le modifică. Nu știu ce spunea Dorim mai devreme, că pot să traduc în un gram de apă pe Marte este mult mai prețios decât un gram de aur. Sau Heliu 3. Heliu 3 există peste tot în anumite proporții, într-o proporție mai mare pe lună unde s-a format pentru că luna nu are atmosferă și că tot fost bombardat regolitul cu așa ceva. Adică nu e o mare minune. După aia spațiu în... care produc elemente spațiale, rachete, care exploatează satei. Cam toate companiile sunt private. E vorba de un alt concept. Și atunci motivațiile pe care le are noua generație s-ar putea să se, să se schimbe. 
La asta trebuie să ne gândim. Noi trăim într-o perioadă în care de-abia am început să existăm ca civilizații. De-abia am început să înțelegem că suntem conduși de inovare. Acum 50 de ani încă civilizații, țări foarte civilizate, omorau oameni, castrau oameni chimic. Gândiți-vă la lucrurile astea. Adică noi suntem într-o, într-un moment în care se schimbă lucrurile. Și aceasta poate să ne modifice și conceptul despre cum facem bani prinzând un asteroid. Mai curând facem bani închirind, utilizând stația spațială internațională care începe să scârție la modul propriu, mecanic, așa utilizând-o ca hotel. Și e interesant, un Honey Week pe Space Station poate să fie accesibil pentru unii și foarte nepediculos. Deci, ceea ce ne interesează mai mult este schimbarea de concepte care o aduce spațiu. Eu mă gândesc și utilizez în discursuri de câțiva ani faptul că spațiu a propulsat lucruri foarte noi, care sunt comunicația cuantică, de exemplu. Asta e ceva extraordinar de nou, care ne face să ne gândim practic la teleportare. Eu sunt fizician de meserie și nu, nu, vorbe, nu e science fiction ce spun. Spațiul ne-a făcut să utilizăm inteligența artificială. Un obiect care se plimbă pe Marte fără inteligență, adică un rover, fără inteligență artificială e mort, pentru că nu putem să el nu poate să ia o decizie, să primească o decizie de pe sol. Are nevoie de jumătate de ore timp dus să întors ca să își deblocheze o roată dacă se mișcă și atunci trebuie să învețe. Doi sateliți pe orbită, dacă nu au inteligență artificială, nu pot să evite ciocnirea în caz că e ceva periculos. Sistemele de collision avoidance sau inteligență artificială masivă. Adică lucrurile astea, spațiu generează lucruri noi pentru planetă, lucrurile astea noi pentru planetă pot fi folosite și spațiu generează o schimbare, hai să spunem, de gândire a societății. Așa cum în 1958 când s-a înființat Comitetul ONU pentru Spațiu, sateliții de observare au asigurat echilibru între cele două blocuri militare, pentru că avioanele de observare erau doborite și pentru că au stabilit acolo că de la limita Karman în sus, de pe la 100 de km în sus, spațiul al tuturor. Și atunci au folosit sateliți Sateliții respective au asigurat o stabilitate foarte serioasă între cele două blocuri militare. Tot așa, acum, spațiul va oferi alte soluții. Gândiți-vă la sateliții SpaceX, de exemplu, mulți, care trimit 5G peste tot. Acești sateliți nu au numai rol de a oferi comunicație 5G pentru cei care trăiesc pe vârf de munte sau pe ocean. E și un rol de a transmite informație în toată lumea, indiferent de sistemul social în care se află. Adică lucrurile astea sunt puțin mai complicate și astea împreună cu faptul că noua generație înțelege altfel banii și averile decât le-am înțeles noi, lucrurile astea probabil vor conduce la o schimbare destul de serioasă. Și eu cam asta, cam asta estimez și aici cred că l-aș ruga să comenteze pe mai tânărul nostru scientist care a vorbit despre cum se explorează, despre misiunea Europa, cum se spune la JPL, și despre radarul la orbita în jurul lui Jupiter, cum luat Mitroiei. Mulțumesc! Bine, la sfârșit voi adăuga și eu ceva. Da, da. nu uitați și acela segment de întrebare legat de militarizare a spațiului și ce opinie aveți noastră 
despre Hai să spun eu atunci. Fiecare țară, să spun, o militarizare, tot eu trebuie să răspund, pentru că din nefericire suntem implicați în lucrul ăsta. Militarizare înseamnă, în primul rând, utilizarea sistemelor spațiale. Nu înseamnă să bombard, să dobor sateliți. Înseamnă să utilizezi sateliți pentru comunicație, pentru observație, pe așa, militar. În armată, orice sistem, un bocanc, este armă dacă e militar. Pentru că bocancul ăla, în afară de faptul că trebuie să umbli cu el, ea face și niște teste, știu eu, să dărâme o ușă sau o piatră. Da. Și este o armă. Militarizarea conduci este în momentul ăsta un concept de o complicație pe care majoritatea oamenilor nu o înțeleg practic. Militarizarea înseamnă în primul rând informație. Înseamnă utilizarea, este, îi spunem ușor, războiul informatic, dar asta este în acest moment. Spațiul este locul prin care circulă informație globală. Prin sistemele spațiale circulă aproximativ 40%, este o estimare, 40% din informația care se schimbă în lume. Și atunci este evident că puterea se obține prin sisteme spațiale în acest moment. Militarizarea propriu zisă înseamnă trecerea prin niște etape în care țările care s-au ajuns, care sunt cele două mari puteri, au anumite reticențe să lase și alte țări care se dezvoltă acum să-și încerce propriile arme. În rest, este destul de dificil în momentul ăsta să vorbești despre faptul că pui o bază militară pe lună ca să ții sub observație o zonă de pe teră. Cam asta vreau să comentez și rog pe Dori să spună el în continuare ce părere are. În primul rând, privitor la spațiul cosmic, avem un tratat internațional, Outer Space Treaty, din 1967. În acesta este prevăzut destul de clar faptul că spațiul cosmic trebuie să rămână pașnic. Desigur, se permite un anumit grad de militarizare atâta timp cât el este folosit în scopuri defensive pentru comunicații, observații, desigur și ascultare electronică și alte elemente, dar nu în scopuri agresive. Să nu se atace de acolo din spațiul cosmic. De asemenea, sunt interzise expres exploziile nucleare în spațiul cosmic, armele biologice, armele de distrugere în masă în principal. Aceasta se aplică și activităților cosmice pe alte corpuri cerești. Desigur, lucrurile s-au dezvoltat în timp. O militarizare a spațiului cosmic s-a produs inevitabil, dar nu s-a ajuns la conflict în spațiul cosmic sau din spațiul cosmic. Uh, aseturile, infrastructura militară în spațiul cosmic este folosită în primul rând pentru obținerea de informații de diferite tipuri și pentru comunicații, desigur. Uh, dacă privim problema puțin altfel, ce generează în principal războaiele pe Terra? Lupta pentru resurse. Dacă privim din punctul acesta de vedere și ce vom face când ne vom lupta pentru resurse în spațiul cosmic, va trebui ca pe lângă acest tratat al spațiului cosmic, care vrând nevrând toate țările semnatare trebuie să-l respecte, să găsească tot felul de portițe, de metode de a-l evita sau de a nu declanșa efectiv un conflict activ, ci de a utiliza resursele, să zic, militare, pentru a obține dominație, pentru a obține oprirea celorlalți competitori de a-și dezvolta aceleași instrumente în spațiul cosmic. În principal, în această zonă ne învârtim acum. Dacă este să luăm doctrinele militare și doctrinele spațiale ale marilor puteri, vom vedea clar acolo ce scrie, cum scrie și care sunt principalele elemente care stau la baza lor. Desigur... Putem să găsim free pe internet doctrina spațială a Statelor Unite. Vom vedea că una din, unul din elementele principale 
este de a controla, de a controla din spațiul cosmic, de a domina, dacă este posibil, de a opri pe oricine ar putea fi un potențial adversar de a plasa în spațiul cosmic arme care ar putea afecta atât Statele Unite, economia americană, interesele strategice în lume și așa mai departe. Deci oricum o competiție, inclusiv pe linie militară, există. Depinde până unde se dezvoltă în limita celor agreate, semnate, convenite deja la nivel internațional pe Pământ. Vreau să dau ceva apropo de asta. Există în NATO un joc militar, există de vreo 15 ani, care se numește A Day Without Space. Este un joc de război care înseamnă în anul 2022-2023-2024 se este un satelit se distruge. Satelitul respectiv generează debriuri, debriuri care creează o reacție în lanț. Este cum, mă rog, povestea din filmul Gravity, dar real. Adică făcută de NATO, făcut, e un exercițiu făcut la Academia NATO din Carmen Spartan. Și care se face, e la a treia ediție. Și în câteva ore cad toate sistemele spațiale, la care Pământul rămâne quasi dezarmat. Adică o țară care poate să trimită o rachetă primitivă, un satelit primitiv, de patru ori mai scump și de patru ori mai prost, poate să genereze cu oarecare șansă astfel, o astfel de reacție în lanț. Asta vreau să, să înțelegeți. Aici există niște pericole. Aici sunt niște probleme. Și aseturile la ora asta, succesul în război, nu mai înseamnă că ai câștigat nu știu câți bani, că ai cucerit un teritoriu, că ai omorât nu știu câți oameni. Înseamnă dominație, în primul rând, să spunem, structurală, neapărat informatic. Și jocul, echilibrul, din acest punct de vedere, este foarte, foarte sensibil în acest moment. Ceea ce sperăm este, așa cum s-a ajuns în ONU, acum vorbesc, știți și toți, orbita geostaționară este unică, este un pirișor așa în jurul Pământului, este resursă naturală limitată. Această orbită a ajuns să fie reglementată extraordinar de fin de International Telecommunication Union pentru sateliții de comunicații, totul condus de business. Comunicațiile sunt un business fantastic. Și pe această orbită nu a pus nimeni până acum o sursă activă, sau a fost pusă de imediat în departare, o sursă nucleară, un reactor nuclear. Toți sateliții utilizează, pentru că dacă se defectează un reactor nuclear, el impurifică orbita și acele resturi radioactive rămân pe orbită și strică electronica și strică toți sateliții. Acest echilibru care e foarte fin s-a obținut din 1962 de când s-a lansat primul satelit comercial de comunicație prin care am reușit să vedem Olimpiada de la Tokyo în Europa și în America. De atunci, acest uh, echilibru se ține. Asta înseamnă, asta înseamnă și civilizație. Asta este un exemplu pe care spațiul poate să-l dea pentru alte uh, domenii. Mulțumesc! Mulțumesc și eu foarte mult! Uh, Produc o poloadă, dacă îmi uitați. Mă rog, lasă văd cine vorbește. Domnul, domnul Adumitroai vorbește. Păi eu am, am, am întrerupt uh, video, da, da. Video ca să meargă mai, mai bine. Deci, uităm că militarizarea folosește rezultatele cercetării. Și dacă ne uităm la bugetele comparativ între NASA și Departamentul de Apărare, Departamentul de Apărare are aproape de 40 de ori mai mare bugetul decât... NASA, dar se folosește în mod 
obraznic, aș, aș spune, de rezultatele cercetării celor de la NASA. Deci, eu sunt convins că e o, e o problemă de, de direcție. Atâta vreme cât societatea americană este dominată de complexul militar-industrial, va fi foarte greu să ajungem la un sentiment călduț în care să spunem, alocăm resurse acum pentru mijloace sau pentru scopuri pașnice. Deci, problema este foarte complicată și chiar e șarpele care își mușcă coada. Deci, trebuie să vină cineva să taie acest cerc vicios. Și atunci, probabil că vom putea să ne concentrăm mai mult asupra extinderii în spațiu ca specie și nu ca comercianți sau na, goana după profit. Va fi goana după, după cunoaștere. Da, însă lucrurile merg. Adriana, văd că vrei să spui, dar o, o lucrurile, lucrurile merg în ambele sensuri. Să nu uităm că misiunile Mercury, în care s-au lansat primii astronauți americani în spațiu, după, la, la mai puțin de un an după cel sovietic, au folosit motoare care erau practic identice cu V2-urile lansate de germani, adaptate la producția americană. Deci, iată, o primă misiune cu echipaj uman, civilă, adică NASA la vremea respectivă era și este o organizație civilă, cu tehnologie militară. Și la fel este reversul, cum a spus domnul Piso, cum a zis tot Virgile, este natura umană. În momentul când vei avea de apărat farfuria cu mâncare sau cutia cu aur, apare și arma alături la șold. Da, Adriane, spune tu. Da, deci aș vrea să reiau, poate să schimb puțin cursul discuției și dar, să reiau câteva puncte care au fost făcute mai înainte, de exemplu, de domnul președinte Piso, legat de inteligența artificială și, de fapt, de resursele interesante pe lună. După părerea mea, înainte de a folosi resursele chiar de apă și așa mai departe, principal lucru care companiile vor putea vinde este informație. Deci, datele, resource maps, deci tot ce facem legate de explorare, înainte de a face, zic, utilizarea, trebuie să știi unde sunt. Deci companiile care vor, știu, vinde informații, să spunem așa, cred că vor avea primele care vor avea succes. Impactul la inteligența artificială este neclar, nu numai pe, ce impact are în spațiu, și ce impact are, evident, pe pământ, ca să zic așa. Dar, clar, folosirea de o putere de calcul mai mare și de algoritm mai special, care mă rog, consideră să zic inteligența artificială, au implicații, de exemplu, la nivelul creierii unor noi produse în, în low G, hai să spunem, deci, sau în zero G. Deci, noi materiale, noi, deci există foarte multe implicații interesante a, a, a inteligenței artificiale și, evident, și afectând spațiul. Dar, cum să spun, cum spunea cineva, e greu de prezis, mai ales viitorul. No, acum mi-aș permite, dacă îmi dați voie, având în vedere că mie, spun acasă, pentru că acolo e acasă, orice român acasă în România, este, este deja ora 1, a trecut de miezul nopții și știu că am abuzat deja de timpul mai multora dintre vorbitorii de astăzi, dintre speaker, care deja aveau alte, alte um, întâlniri programate în după amiaza aceasta și au ales totuși să rămână alături de noi și Aș dori să vă mulțumesc tuturor în România, Los Angeles. Misiunea României aici, pe coasta de vest, își propune să rămână în următoarele, sau să devină din ce în ce mai mult în următoarele luni, un forum de întâlnire pentru oameni de știință români și români americani și americani pe mai multe tematici, obiectivele fiind evident acela de ai pune la un loc pe oameni de știință, a consolida comunitatea academică română-americană din vestul Statelor Unite 
de a consolida colaborarea cu comunitatea științifică din România cu un efect direct de consolidarea întregii dimensiuni academice a parteneriatului strategic român-american. Din nou, vă mulțumesc din suflet, vă doresc să aveți o după amiază aici în Statele Unite cât mai plăcută și o noapte bună în România. O să-mi permit să vă transmit invitații de conferințe și să le figurez încă de acum. O să fie de pe științe medicale în luna aprilie, undeva după Ziua Internațională a Medicinei din 17, pentru că pică într-o sâmbătă, probabil în ultima decadă. Cred că, cred că în cadrul dezbaterilor specialiștii din științe spațiale cu specialiștii din științele medicale ar putea foarte bine să de idei absolut inovatoare. Încă o dată vă mulțumesc, încă o dată vă doresc să aveți uh, să vizite și să ne poate la anul uh, în condiții normale fie la universitatea acesta, dar cu prezență uh, personală. Încă o dată multă recunoștință și uh, multă sănătate. Foarte bună tuturor, vă mulțumesc și eu foarte mult, a fost foarte interesant. Chiar necesit organizarea unei conferințe, poate de două zile undeva, fizic, în care să ne expunem punctele de vedere și să avem și multe întrebări de la public. De data aceasta am avut multe întrebări între noi și a fost foarte bine. Foarte bună de dezbatere. O să o, vă spun că proba, cel mai probabil filmul înregistrat al acestei conferințe, în varianta sa dezbătută în limba engleză, va fi postat pe canalul YouTube oficial al Consulatului General Mina Los Angeles. Sigur că o să vă transmitem. Mulțumesc, domnule. Mulțumesc pentru a valorifica și de Mulțumesc, stimați colegi, să ne revedem cât mai curând. Mulțumesc, 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 M